Opera Protects, dear viewers. Tonight, we have a very special guest on Roll of Attention. I am, as always, Nikita Zuev. Uh, we've got here XJ and Robert Gibson, but who am I kidding? Everyone is looking at the top of the screen, seeing Graham McNeil and thinking, what do they have to pay? Um, Graham, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is uh, this is truly a blessing in disguise. Oh, my, uh, my pleasure. That that you um, you know it all started with me just uh, asking you a couple of things on Twitter, and you know it it surmounted to this, and I am uh, very thankful for for the fact no, that uh, absolutely. I'm always always happy to come speak to folk about stories and writing. You know, that's just something I could I could talk to the cows come home on that. Yeah, and uh, well. Um, Let's uh, let's talk about the story that um, is on the on the docket today, uh, the last church. I'll give a small uh, smart a small summary uh, regarding it, written by Graham McNeil himself. All right, guys. So <laughs> it's going to be something great. The last church is a short story set on the eve of the Great Crusade, when the armies of the Emperor set out from Terra to conquer the galaxy for humanity. In the dead of night, a mysterious stranger visits the last remaining church on Terra, a lonely outpost on all but abandoned island to debate its lonely priest. In an age of reasons and science, what need has a newly secular world of a building that venerates gods? Their debate lasts until dawn, when the shocking truth of the stranger's identity is revealed and the last stone of the last church falls. Dun, dun, dun. So that is the that is the tale that we have all read, and some of us wrote. <laughs> um, and uh, what, did you actually read it uh, before before this? Um, I did. Yes, really? I got okay. my copy of I got my dog-eared copy of Tales of Heresy out to refresh myself on it. I mean, I it's a story I know pretty well. Um, even I mean, it was written like I don't know, fourteen, fifteen years ago, but I. It's, it was a story at the time and still very close to my heart. So I know it pretty well, but I figured if I'm going to come on here and talk to you guys with a, a level of knowledge about it, of current reading, then I should probably get a refresher course on it. So yes, I, I dug it out yesterday and had a, a read back of it. Yeah, so I, during our conversation when I asked you to come on the show, uh, we spent a, uh, you know, a bit of a back and forth of what to talk about, and we settled on The Last Church, and you said that it was quite an important story for you. Could, mm -hmm. could we know why uh, it was so important for you, this story? Yeah, it was, well, it was a story. I mean, it's a lot of the reading I'd been doing at that time touched on a lot of these topics, and... I'm I'm somebody that when they they find a, a, a juicy topic or road to explore, it kind of consumes my thinking for a while. That it, and I want those thoughts and those <clears throat> readings to sort of permeate, you know, what I'm writing at that point. Um, and at the time when I was commissioned to do a story for the book, the Tales of Heresy anthology, you know, I was I was late coming to that book to that project because I was. Uh, I was finishing up a, a novel at the time when the request came in and I thought, oh, yeah, I should be able to get it done, but, you know, I've got this novel to finish. So um, so by the time I got the novel finished and was ready to start pitching out what the story would be, a lot of the other authors had already delivered their stories for the anthology. So I, I said to Lindsay Priestley, who's my editor on that book, uh, look, can you give me a, can you send me like a, a couple of line pitches, synopses for what the other stories are going to be. So I don't end up, you know, either duplicating effort and writing something that you've already got a story about or thematically or subject matter touch on areas that you've already got three stories of them. So that'd be a bit of wasted effort. So she, she sent me like a little paragraph pitch for all the stories in the book. And when I, when I read them, I was like, they all cool. These all sound great. I like them. But the thing that, stood out for me on them was that they were all very quite heavily action orientated. They were all, you know, shooty death kill in space but, but all the time. And like akin to I, two kinds of fool, which we reviewed uh, before. We, we reviewed two yeah, kinds it, of Yeah, it, yeah, it was a bolt of yeah. blazing, chainsaw yeah, yeah. slashing yeah. combat story. Uh, and they were, they were, they all kind of fell quite squarely into that, that sort of genre of 40k fiction. 
or heresy year of fiction. So I looked at that and thought, I'd like, I feel, I, I like, I like anthologies where there's a, a variety of tone and style of storytelling. So it's not all kind of one note. So I, I looked at it and thought, well, okay, let's, what's the absolute, you know, opposite of all these stories? I mean, they're all, they're all great stories, but I didn't want to do another one of the, the pack, so to speak. So I was like, okay, can I tell a story that doesn't have any bolters blazing, chainsaw slashing story and still make it uh, interesting and exciting and have a, a story that hopefully still pulls you through from the first word to the last word. Um, so I sort of set myself, well, it was a challenge for for myself, for the readers and for Black Library, frankly, because it's like, you know, the, the brand of stories of Warhammer is shitty death kill in space. So stories that don't do that might, you know, break the mold or uh, that sounds a bit grandiose, but they might not quite fit what the, the, the anthology wants or needs to be. So I pitched the story out as to what it could be. And, you know, like Lindsay, she, you know, they, she had her doubts. She was like, well, I don't know, we kind of, we'd like, wait, maybe I want a bit of action in it. And I was like, no, no, let's just, you know, if we do want that, if you find, if we, if I write it and you find that yes, it still needs that, fine, we can add it. But let's, let's you know, take a big swing, to do something that is a little bit different from right. Let's be you know, brave. What we, what, yeah, exactly. And if it doesn't work, sure, we can retool it. But let's at least try to do it. So you know, I I wrote the story and yeah, it, you know, I I I wasn't even sure I would be able to tell a story that was just a, a two hander of two guys talking in the church about, you know, one on the one hand, somebody extolling the virtues of what, you know, faith and belief can bring, and the other one basically stomping all over that, saying, no, that thing that you believe in is no place in this new world. And it, that essentially is what it boils down to. And I was like, well, can I sustain that concept for, you know, 30 pages or whatever in a way that's still engaging for the reader? So... Yeah, and, and as it turned out, I had a, had a real fun time with it because I say that a lot of the reading I was doing at the time bled into the story. So obviously there was like quite a bit of uh, things from like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and so on. They fed into the story quite a lot, and it and it reflected a lot of what I was feeling and of the t at the times anyway. So yeah, it's it because it was so different to what I was usually doing. You know, like a lot of my stories. Are very action orientated. They're they're thrillers. They're war movies in book form, you know. And right. I you know I love a bit of you know just I I love a war movie in a in a novel, but I always like to try and add something else into it so that there's more. You're not just there for the gunfire and the spectacle. You're there for something hopefully that will linger with you after you've finished the read. And this was that concept kind of distilled into its purest form. Cool. Awesome. Well, I, I have thank a Thank you very question. much for that answer. I have yes, a question. Uh, if it's not too personal, because you, you mentioned uh, it was a question that you were thinking of at yourself at that time. And so so the story was published in 2009. So when you said Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and all that, right, I was nodding my head because mm -hmm. that I recognize where it all came from. Uh, would you mind telling us what were your personal thoughts on that, if it's not too private? Because you did mention that. no, no, that, that that's it's, it's a good question because it feeds directly into the story and where I was coming from. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I've read like Sam, ha I've read a lot of Sam Harris's books. I uh, read a bunch of Christopher, uh, Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins, and you know, I, I'm, I, I, that's that is where I, I fall a lot of the in the time of their philosophies are I, align very closely with mine. I think. Certainly these days, Richard Dawkins has kind of gone off a, a little bit of... Uh, he's, he's become a bit more strident in the sense of that he's more... A lot of the things he says are kind of off-putting a lot of people who might otherwise have agreed with him. Uh, obviously, Christopher Hitchens is dead, so he's not saying a lot these days. Um, and Sam Harris, yeah, I've, 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 I enjoy his, his writings more when he's in the sort of meditative philosoph philosophical... Uh, writings as opposed to his, you know, polemics, because they, again, they can veer into something I think is a little more extreme than I would generally hold true to. But yeah, the basic, the basics, 
basic tenets that they were talking about in their their books around about that time were very yeah very closely aligned with what I was thinking. Thank you. Uh, I'll hand it back to Nikki. Yeah. It sounds like Robert has awoken and he's got a he's got a, a question. Huh? Do you, do well, you, Robert, you got one? Uh, some questions, but also I'd like to say that I was enormously grateful when I started to read this story and I realized that it wasn't going to be a mere orgy of violence, uh, which I find extremely boring. Uh, it was actually an interesting, well, more than interesting, it was a fascinating uh, philosophical dialogue, really. Mind you, there were there was plenty of action in the flashback sense. Uh, yeah. That what yeah. they were talking about, plenty of action there, and I suppose that helps to round off the the story, uh, make it. Yeah, because I, I certainly wanted a uh, element of to this, this. I mean, this is this is a world on the end. Of the, you know, it's like the the wars to unite Terra are are, are over, but they're still very much, the after effects of that are still rippling out across the globe. People are alive at this point who either took part in those wars or who suffered from them or who saw them and having Uriah the the priest character having him be a you know a, a very personal witness to the the slaughters mm -hmm. in the world i think gave him that perspective on it that somebody who hadn't seen it wouldn't have had you know he'd yeah. seen the bloodshed he'd seen the slaughters and knew he wanted no part of whatever this new emperor's world was going to be if it was built in this manner, in this bloodshed in the past. If that's what it takes to build it, then I want no part of it. So being able that, to see that, some of that, even from somebody's that, recollection. That, that brings me to a question, really, uh, about what I think is the key to the story, the parallelism between Uriah's vision on the field of battle, which he takes to be divine, and the strongly resembling uh, final revelation of the emperor himself in the church, mm -hmm. where there's the same theme of a golden face. Now, I can see that that helps the story's structure an awful lot, but it does raise some questions which puzzle me a lot. Was the emperor himself really there on the battlefield and, and if, because he did say he was at one part of mm -hmm. the story, and if so, was he actually there with uh, Uriah? And if so, did he have a motive for misleading Uriah at that stage? Because if so, I don't really understand why. My feeling is that, yes, he was there, and that the vision that Uriah saw was indeed the Emperor. And because the Emperor... <laughs> The emperor in a lot of the writings we've done about the heresy era is he's not an, he's not a good person. He may he may have the ultimate good of humanity in mind thousands of years in the future, but on an individual day to day level, he's not a good person. So, no. And time scales for him are that are lifetimes for us are blink of an eye to him. So my thought on that was that he essentially was playing a, the long game as far as Uriah was concerned to show him, like, you know, to appear as this divine thing to him as he lay, you know, dying on the battlefield so that later on he could come and show him that thing that you thought was divine. It wasn't. It was me. Right, See, right. everything you've thought, everything you've believed in, it's a lie. So, so he's this shows so you how petty. easily you can be manipulated. Yeah. Because he wants... He's so he petty wants... that cre he created, like... An argument he was going to use like forty years later. Yes, yeah, like all right, exactly. Give me a moment. Exactly, because <laughs> like you know, I'm going to use reason to show you, and hopefully change your mind just by us talking to get you to see it. But if it comes to it, I'm going to show you that the the thing that you that ultimately drove you on this road to become the priest. Surprise! It wasn't true. So mm. come on, let's go. Let's close the doors. Shut up shop. There is no gods. Let's get on with things. Yeah. So that it, because he wanted almost like this to seal the door behind them, saying like when we're leaving Terra, going off to, you know, conquer the galaxy, everything is sorted behind me. It's all mm -hmm. closed. It's all dealt with. It's finished. And I've shown you that it was all a lie. So right. you must now believe in me and come along. Whereas Uriah still is like, mm -hmm. nope, not going to happen. Because the storytelling in this, I wanted, even though 
the emperor is, you know, quote unquote, correct in a lot of the things he says, he's kind of an asshole about it and the bad guy in terms of how he behaves to Uriah and burns his building down at the end, whereas Uriah is again, quote unquote, wrong about some of the, the things that he's because he's based his life on this belief that is shown to be untrue. He's actually kind of the, you know, the one who held true to his beliefs and his faith and was willing to die for them. So you hopefully create a sort of a tension between mm. who you want to believe or who you want to be right or who you want to be the good guy, but isn't and who isn't, but is. Yeah, it's kind of mess with the expectations to what the characters were going to be and where they were going to end up. I, I just want to add mm. how much more it added to the story that Uriah did not follow the emperor. Mm. Because yeah, he, I mean, he, that was from the beginning. He was never going to do that. Yeah. It, so no, that yeah, everything from the last moment of the last day before they left was built on a failure of the emperor that he didn't manage to convince this guy to come out with him. So they were like, okay, well, let's burn it and forget it ever happened. Hmm. Yeah, there's loads of structural irony in the story. I mean, it's 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 uh, the, the irony also is at the end when the emperor goes off to conquer the galaxy, and it's all right when I do it. In other words, as far yes. as uh, all his crusades and stuff. Yes, it? everybody's wrong but me. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're if you're a being that lived for at that point thirty thousand years, it's kind of very hard to believe that you can be wrong. Um, yes, the, uh, I yeah, think there's, there's, a, an arro- there's an arrogance there as well that comes from the sure, fact yeah. that you can become complacent in the belief in your omnipre- you know, omnipresence, but your omnipotence that you can always know every your omniscience rather. That's the word I was looking for. Mm. That you know, when you've been, when you feel you've been right all this time, you feel you don't, you can't make mistakes after that, and that's exactly the point when you start making mistakes when you think you're infallible. You don't take steps to course correct, to hold yourself accountable, to, you know, regularly audit your own decisions to say, am I doing right? Or just, I'm just assuming that I'm always going to be right. Hmm. Well, Hmm. yes, but for me, uh, emperor has always been the emperor of mankind, which means that he is the emperor of every aspect of humanity. Mm -hmm. So if he wasn't arrogant, if he wasn't this flawed in some of his aspects, I don't think he would represent humanity well enough. Oh, and if he wasn't that arrogant, he wouldn't have un- he wouldn't have believed he could undertake such a massive mm. campaign to think, you know, you, nobody who tries to conquer the globe or the galaxy is without ego, <laughs> a massive sure, yeah. ego to think that A, that they are worthy of doing it and B, that they can do it. Mm. So I yeah. understand. I understand that the uh, last church is the first story in which the emperor actually said anything. Uh, yes. So that must have been well. If I if I were given that particular role to 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 <laughs> to fill, I would be super honored. Uh, but also, um, I guess uh, this is a question maybe even Nikki can answer, and that is, so in Dune, Leto the second had his foresight to guide him does the emperor have anything like that to to so that his uh, decisions are infallible in some way or the other nikki you want to take <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> sorry you want me to ask a lot no, okay, no, okay. you were included in the question go for it all right oh god well no pressure kinda. Kinda. It's not really clear in the end. So the origin story of the emperor himself. I shouldn't have drank the. I've I've found out that you like Jack Daniels and Coke as your rock and roll. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you if you drink it anymore, but like uh, apparently that was your on occasion. Your yes. Yeah, yeah. So I've I've had more than one today uh, for the preparations, and I've just finished my <laughs> second one, and I'm thinking maybe I should know. Um, but anyways, the the emperor of mankind was created as this. So he's a psychic. There's There are creatures that are called psychics in the Warhammer universe, and he is a super psychic. He is a psychic beyond any psychic because he is created from thousands of minds of different uh, psychers who, who sort of sacrifice themselves, the greatest among humanity, in order to create the super being that was supposed to save, you know, humans from the terrible plies that were, were to come. Um, however... There, I don't know if I can talk about the end and the death because I've read it, 
I've read the first I, volume. I would steer clear of that one for now. Yeah, it's still very I, new. I would. But there are some revelations in some, certain books about that he had other pieces of the world, like the world history, where he participated, where he was some yeah. very famous characters in, in the history of the world. And, yeah. and the, the Emperor's seen kind of the outcome, if not the circumstances surrounding a lot of what will come in the future. You know, he's he's essentially in a lot of the visions and the way we've written them and over the course of the books, you know, myself and you know, many of the other authors in the series, you know, he's seen the Imperium, you know, the 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 society that will come about ten thousand years after Horus's eventual defeat. That this place is a place of darkness, of ruins and ash and superstition, and like a lot of people, I think he, I think he mistook that in some ways for this is the ultimate chaos victory, and I can't allow that to happen. So I will do everything in my power to stop it by guiding humanity through the thousands of years of its evolution towards the the point where it needs to be to survive what is to come. And to so him, any price I, is worth paying for that. I think, actually, yes, he does have foresight. Because right mm -hmm. before the Great Crusade began, he was like, we got to wait a little bit more so the elders can fuck themselves over. So there's those, this yes. race of elder, and they had to do this terrible thing to themselves and split into two factions, uh, which, yeah. which was basically like, you know, BDSM uh, elves in space um and the uh, you know like when that collapse was created emperor was like okay cool now after the storm of, of chaos that went through the universe has cleared a bunch of stuff now we can start the great crusade so i think he does what well, was the birth of you know to, the birth of slanesh is what cleared out all the warp storms and allowed you know humanity to leave earth and get beyond in the galaxy but yeah the emperor very definitely has foresight it's hmm not perfect it doesn't see everything and a lot of it you know is tainted by the very medium in which visions of the future are carried it's you know t everything is tainted by chaos anything to do with psychics is tainted by the warp and chaos so there's all you've always got to have a little bit of salt ready for that vision of the future to you know like in in the novel uh, false gods horus is shown a vision of the future but he's not, he's, he has no context for what that vision is. And he doesn't realize that actually by turning and betraying the Emperor, he's going to create that future where he sees all the statues of his Primarch brothers, but he's not among them. And he doesn't know why. He, he sees all this and he's not, he's, he's without any sense of how this came to be. And actually, that by choosing the path that he's on, he's inadvertently going to cause that future that he is so scared of seeing and he, to a degree he has that that's revelation, of the emperor he has that revelation around the church doesn't he it's around the monastery mm -hmm. where he sees all of the visages of his brothers and then the emperor but he got, doesn't see himself and so he no. once again you know hubris takes over like, exactly he, where's where's my ego statue is like, where am i i know everybody else's yeah. statues why have i not got one yeah. and you haven't got one because you by choosing this path betray him so of course you don't have that we're Man, not going to put a statue of the great I've betrayer. Read that. It's been 12 well, years since the, I've read know, that or something. It's great the fact you still remember that scene yeah. 12 years later. Holy moly. I wanted to say, actually, how mad were you that you had to follow Horus Rising and actually tell the story of Horus falling? Because it's so much harder than starting the, the Horus Heresy. Oh, no, no I, no. I think Dan had the hardest job there. You know, because we were finding essentially... <laughs> <laughs> and he he basically had to start a, a, a brand new franchise of mm. these novels that are that were tonally very different, structurally very different, had space marines in a very different light. You know, these are not the space marines of the Imperium of Forty K. Mm. Uh, he had to set all of that up in one novel, and he had to make us fall in love with Horus because you know the the thing that often gets forgotten in Tales of Horus is that. He was the emperor's favorite son. He was the the brightest and the best of them. The the guy you had to, you would be willing to march into hell alongside, so that when his fall comes, it means something. You know, the betrayal of somebody who hated you means nothing. The betrayal of your trusted, most beloved friend it has impact. 
so I think Dan had a tremendously difficult job to set all that up to make us view this character who we've hated for decades of 40k right, fiction he's the main history. Traitor, yeah. yeah he's the, he, he's a his name is a byword for betrayal treachery and corruption so to make us in the course of just the first couple of chapters you just yeah. think you like i love horace and i would die for him mm. so that the, the hardest part for me in doing false gods and dan and i were in constant communication email phone calls over the writing of these yeah. books to make sure that you know our characters felt like the same characters from book to book like um, Gabriel Loken because he's in the same yeah he's been Loken right? Torgadon all the others they sounded the same they looked the same they behaved the same you know within the fact that they were changing and developing as the story went on and so right. on but the hardest part for me was like I I just absolutely loved Horus Rising it was, I read it and it, was, it just blew me away it good. I was, I've I had not read a book that excited me that much in a long, long time. So I remember even now when, the first time I read it was I was there when the Horus killed the Emperor. And I was like, what to me, that's up there with the sky over the port was the color of a television tuned to a dead channel. Yeah. That's up there with that line for me. But the, the hardest part was thinking, okay, I've got to, I've got to follow that. I've got to do a book <laughs> yeah. that hopefully excites people and it maintains the quality that. Dan Abnett did. I mean, following Dan Abnett and anything is a daunting prospect, but following him when he was on fire with mm -hmm. Horus Rising was even more so. But so that they were the, those were the two things that were most, you know, were uppermost in my mind. But then it was also the fact that what I hated, quote unquote, was the fact that I had to turn Horus bad in my mm -hmm. book. And I, I loved Horus in the first book. He was, I, he was such a wonderful character. He was he had humor, he had courage, he had honor, and the the last the last scenes in Horus Rising where he's lamenting that you know he's on his own now out in the world without the Emperor by his side, you're just your heart broke for him. So taking him in the second book and saying right, I've got to, you know, put you through the ringer and hit you with hammers and do all these terrible things to you to bring you to the point where you're going to betray your father. That was hard and horrible and you did because you didn't want to because you're the natural inclination of a lot of writers miss is to, to coddle their main character because they fall in love with them and they don't want to do terrible things to them whereas in this case it's like yeah i've got to do the very worst thing to you in this book so that that was the hardest part of the book you know let alone following dan but no I, it was a, it was an honor to to follow a book that was so well written as horus rising i think horus uh seems to be especially at the beginning of false gods and throughout horse rising he just seems to be the better emperor he seems to be the emperor that you want the emperor to be you know he is mm -hmm. he has so much more um, of that positive side of humanity right he is warm he he sees each person for their worth and he understands that he needs to be per perceived in a certain light right he understands mm -hmm. how people see it so for example with the uh, there are scenes with the monorail um i, I don't know exactly mm -hmm. how you pronounce that i'm sorry I'm, yeah, you know, yeah the monorail yeah is it okay the monorail mm -hmm. so they are used as this political tool to say what horse wants to say but can't say because mm -hmm. he has to look polite and the neutral side right and yeah, so it can be his he, attack dogs yeah so he's like he's a master politician and then slowly over time so you see th th this is the terribleness of it uh, which i find really amazing by the way right like so the the terribleness of the situation where in false gods you realize that now this mastermind this really clever guy who knows how to appeal to humanity and to charisma of the people he's now bad and he's doing it mm -hmm. right like right at the end of if i remember correctly the they started a war against these people who were super friendly because apparently they were going to assassinate Horus and they mm. actually weren't going to assassinate him. So it's not a, that clear from what I yeah. remember. Yeah, but... I mean, Horus's skill is always about getting the, you know, all the Primarchs to a degree represent an aspect of the Emperor, mm, okay. a singular aspect of the Emperor particularly, uh, whereas Horus was the one who was a kind he could combine a many great characteristics the good ones of the emperor and also the bad ones and one of his skills is knowing how to use the pieces and at his disposal to 
get the outcome he wants. You know, Gulliman, you're awesome at this. Lion, you're good at that. Russ, you, uh, he's a force multiplier for all the people under his command. And that's one of his great skills and one of the Imperium's, you know, greatest fears when he turns traitor. Awesome. I mean, it's not awesome that he turned into traitor, but it's, it's, it's you, you know, know, it's an awesome explanation. Like, I can clearly see in my mind now yeah. who they are. Um, mm -hmm. For me, so coming back to the last church, for me, mm -hmm. the, the story lives or dies on the arguments between two individuals. Whenever you have a story, it's about two folk in a remote, isolated place where they uh, sort of they have to be together, like the lighthouse mm -hmm. uh, with William Defoe and um, mm, Robert Pattinson. Patrick, Robert Pattinson, that's right. Uh, you know, that whole thing, it, it, it's the story of these two dudes. And if they, you You're don't care about mad. what's happening to them, yeah, exactly. Um, so if you don't care about what's going on to them, the movie falls apart. But it's the same here. And I thought, walking into it, I've heard from my buddy, like, oh, you know, here's uh, Tales of Heresy. Have a read of this. Make sure you read The Last Church. And I was like, what's it about? And he was like, oh, it's the emperor talking to a priest. And I was like, what? Where are my bolter guns? You know, so I, I was, at that time, the, the, the guy... You know, who was reading Warhammer for the fact that I had these miniatures and I wanted, you know, mm -hmm. boulder shells to explode. And then I read that um, and I stood on it. And the first two pages set up the stage for me where I was just like, okay, this is not a Warhammer story. Mm -hmm. This is a story about what it means to believe and what it means to reject belief, right? And it is beautifully wrapped in the struggles of the emperor and the 40,000 universe. And I think that's that's what really drew me into it, right? The fact that it, oh, it was not just awesome. a backdrop, right, for the creation of, of, of Warhammer, but it is also, it's also actually trying to ask you as a person, where do you stand between these two people? Now, mm -hmm. I have to say that in a lot of ways, I do feel like the Emperor had the upper hand a lot, but very quite rightly, you said that you don't want to be on his side because he's he's being so callous about the way he talks about mm -hmm. it, as, as the Emperor later does in basically almost every appearance that he has. He's, he's a terrible guy, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. Um, so I I got the feeling, right, from from reading that and from thinking about what chaos later will become, Right, like how how this will later impact the galaxy. Um, this this might be a bit of a out of left field, but this is what I started thinking at the time when I was reading this uh, story, um, and now also knowing that you do like the Lovecraftian mythos, I can't help but think like, was there ever when you guys talked uh, in the writers' room or like during your Horus Heresy like uh, discussions, was there ever a a discussion about thematic reasoning for the chaos uh, existing in a sense of like is this the is this the continuation of what cosmic horror meant to be right because it seems to me like the it's like the evolution the the horse uh, not the horse the the chaos um incursions right based on emotions they kind of explain where the cosmic horror comes from and it makes them even more terrifying, right? So is is that any kind of a direction where you guys were going, or am I completely off the mark here? Uh, I don't know that it would be... I, would, I wouldn't ever think of it as a particular direction that we chose mm. in the sense... I mean, I, I love the whole Lovecraftian mythos, and it definitely permeates some of the thematics in my writing that, you know, I, I love that whole aspect of cosmic horror of, you know, we are... The, insignificant dots on a rock flying through space and have no more significance than that so that can't help but permeate my writings I've, I've read you know the, the mythos stories you know lovecraft derleth clark Aston smith all that sort of stuff from you know a very early age so it's always been in there uh i don't know that i would classify it as a particular direction that we talked about choosing in terms of what the chaos gods would be um because i mean Certainly, in the, the the Lovecraftian mythos, the the elder gods and the old ones aren't; they're not as easily 
pigeonholed into this in the same way that you can do with corn slanesh nurgle and so on there yeah but you don't have to design like particular... arm... you don't have to design like armies around those gods right you have to design no, something around I, mean, it, I would it, i would say it wasn't a conscious decision yeah. or thought process that we went through but i'd be surprised if you know with some deeper analysis you didn't look at a lot of the stuff that i've written and go and you could pick out the, the Lovecraftian influences throughout it, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> yes, go on. I, uh, I, I find it quite remarkable that, well, maybe it's, it's inevitable, actually, that uh, a story like this can be seen from either side of the debate. Uh, the the non-religious person can appreciate the fact that as you said uh graham the the emperor seems to have had the best of the argument um but a religious person like me can simply say well all right so uriah was fooled as far as the uh immediate origin of his feelings of awe and wonder but those feelings of awe and wonder are in themselves qualitatively mm -hmm. not derivable from the matter energy universe which a materialist would say is all all that there is in yeah, other words I mean, they are no less real to him it's, yeah. uh, it's necessarily qualitative rather than mm -hmm. quantitative and you know in philosophy there's the term the qualia which corresponds mm -hmm. for quantity to the quanta which is sorry, quality, which the quanta is for quantity, mm -hmm. and the qualia are uh, irreducible in the sense that they are um, not uh, not derivable from, from fact, as, as we call fact. So mm -hmm. to me, uh, people arguing about uh, religion are too late because the fact that they can argue at all on qualitative subjects like this means the pass has been sold before the debate has begun if you if you get my meaning mm -hmm. uh, yeah because I mean, ultimately it, it doesn't matter what the emperor will say to uriah because his you know uh, there's been ten thousand years and then some of history behind the belief and the thought processes that lead to that moment in his mind anyway so he was never going to be able to persuade him and as you know players of warhammer and 40k know that actually the emperor was lying ultimately because gods do exist the the chaos gods in the warp are real i mean whether they whether the the god that uriah believes in was a real thing is kind of immaterial to the debate it's not about a particular singular entity it's about the belief and the faith that you have in that and what that means to you and what it can achieve for you in your life and how mm. it can be manifested in your actions later on so i get the i get the impression that from what little i've uh, heard which is mostly from that chap whose name i forget who gave the summary of the warhammer um mm. the, in the video i don't know I'll, I'll find out his name but carry on yeah i i get the impression that the the, the huge godlike beings in the warp are not so much qualitatively transcendent as simply enormously powerful yeah it's, it's that whole you know like any being that displays enough power to uh, that would be equivalent to a god might as well just be called one uh mm. i mean they're, they're not individualistic beings as such they are creations of humanities or living beings mm. psyches made real in the, the matter of the the warp um mm. you know slanesh is one that was the, the the newest one that was born was very much a you know the sort of psychic death scream of an entire species uh mm. but yes they're, they're, they're not yeah 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 or mm. yeah. well, as a okay. thought in in lovecraft is is the crawling chaos uh, is, yeah. is simply a, a principle of chaos really rather than a than a being yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, um, the only, I mean, go on. I'm sorry, sorry, carry sorry. on. No, 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 you, yeah, you say, well, you've got, you know, you've got Cthulhu himself, who, you know, is a, a being of physicality, who, you know, lives, you know, sleeps eternally under the Pacific. Um, but yeah, I, th- you know, I always look at the physicality of these Lovecraftian entities as something manifested for the for a specific purpose or aspect of their unknowable purposes rather than you know you could defeat them you know in a fist fight if you were big enough kind of thing you know like mm-hmm. you know Godzilla's not going to come out and beat up Cthulhu and that's the end of Cthulhu because there's more to him than just his you know rubbery protoplasmic flesh that you can drive a boat through if need be hmm the the name of the chap uh, who who the video if I, I shared with you uh, Robert was Arbiter uh, Ian. He's, he's got like mm. a YouTube channel where it, he's got he's pretty good at explaining yeah. that kind yeah, of stuff. No, I know, I know his stuff. Yeah. Oh damn. Okay. Well, uh, this this uh, this is an accidental little ad. Ian, I'll be expecting you know our paycheck. <laughs> Commission month. payment soon. Exactly. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um. All right. So. The universe of Warhammer is quite expansive. Um, and I've asked a couple of folks that I know myself um, to, to see if they have got any any kind of questions for you, uh, Graham. And I also posted like a question or two on, on Reddit to see what they were they wanted to ask. Do you, do you want to do like a quick, I'll ask you like Q&A. five or so questions. Quick and you'll Q&A. Like yeah, a, yeah, let's go for it. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. uh, more Iron Warriors. Yes or no? Are you going to do anything with Iron Warriors anytime soon or ever? Yes. yes. Cool. Um, are you sad that Horus Heresy and the Siege of Terror uh, is coming to a close, more or less? Or is it sort of a more bitter, bittersweet situation for you? It's very much the latter. Very much the latter. I mean, the, the Horus Heresy has been part of my writing career God, what for the last seventeen odd years now? I mean, it, it's. I mean, the the first book I think came out in like Horus Rising was two thousand five, mm-hmm. I think, around about then. That's right. Um. So yeah, I mean, it, it's it's formed a it's formed a huge backbone of my writing career for the last decade and some. So, on the one hand, I'm. It, it's a very curious mix of emotions. On the one hand, I'm glad. That we've actually managed to bring it to the finish line because it's you know what the, the horus heresy series was what like 57 59 books or so and the siege of terror is like eight novels or well by the time it finishes maybe eight or nine novels a bunch of novellas along the way sort of brought such a or been part of the team that brought such a massive undertaking to the finish line is I you know I'm amazed that it's that it's lasted this long and that the reader's appetite has been there and the writer's appetite has been there to maintain it at such a pace and hopefully level of quality to this stage. So I'm pleased that we're getting to the end of it because my God, what an undertaking it was from the very beginning. On the other hand, I'm I'm very sad that it's ending because I, I have never had as much fun writing novels. Than I have writing Horus Heresy novels, novellas, short stories, and what have you. It's such a rich theme of IP and stories and character and emotion to mine for stories. So I'm sad that that as a an ongoing story is you know coming to its conclusion. Uh so yeah, it's a, a bittersweet mix of I'm glad we got it here and that the finish line is in sight, but I'll be sad to see it cross the line because it's, it's like. Whenever you finish a novel, you're you're glad it's done. You're glad you're finished it, but you're going to miss spending time with those characters. You know, you you, you right. come to form a a weirdly special bond with your characters. You you you've loved spending time in their world and putting them through the ringer and enjoying their triumphs and being there with them when things go wrong. And then when you're done with the story, it's like, oh, I that, that's it. I don't need to. I, I'm not going to spend time in their world anymore and that is quite quite it's a real thing it's a real thing that you miss spending time with characters that you've had living in your head for months and months years can't you even. can't you and just write a run. short story where you're all sitting in a bar you were graham mcneil yeah and it was all a we dream were we're all yeah exactly in a bar yeah everyone's like ah oh, it's gonna be all right graham no one really does yeah you know? 
Um, so yeah, it's it's a mix. I'm I'm glad we got it here, uh, but it'll be sad yeah. to sort of say goodbye to that series. I mean, it is a monster. Okay. It's, oh yeah. I I I am very invested in in Warhammer and in Horus Heresy, but I also have a life and I need to earn money. So it's like yeah. every time every every time that I continue on my journey, uh, on the Horus Heresy bandwagon, I. I look up and I see, oh, there's like ten more books that I have mm -hmm. to add to the list that I have to buy and well, read. We always, we always said in the <clears throat> over the years that we were writing it, because initially it was never planned to be anything as, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, it was originally to be massive. five, uh, five. Well, we didn't have a specific books. name. We didn't have yeah. a specific number in mind. It was very much like we'll do an opening trilogy, a closing trilogy, and maybe I don't know some books in between. Uh, you know, a handful, five, six, eight, whatever. We don't know what it'll be. Uh, but then very quickly, once we really started to get into the, the process of writing the books, we realized, actually, this is going to be a lot longer than we expected. And But it was always predicated on the notion that as long as the readers are invested and want to keep this going, and as long as the writers are finding new, interesting stories to tell and keep the momentum going in a way that's uh, surprising and exciting and that people want to see then let's just tell the stories that as as we've you know this as the roller coaster goes on awesome. and you know it, it ended up being like i say like close to 60 novels for the main spine plus you know yeah. all the and then you made a sequel apologies. right you made a sequel called the siege of terror which is still ongoing indeed uh, well that, that's uh, as it you know by the time we got close to the end we knew it was going to have to be something yeah uh you know of of its own we couldn't just go book yeah. 61 62 you know it wasn't it had to be it was such a singular event that mm. could never be told in like one book so we knew yeah let's let's translate that into its own thing right let's go big got it yeah go big uh, or go home indeed so warhammer the old world is imminently returning for I don't know how many years that they keep talking about it imminently returning. I'm not gonna ask you if it's coming or not. All I wanna ask is well, if definitely coming, there... yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely if, coming. Uh, def at some point. Uh, if um, if it does return, uh, because you know I'm not as faithful as you are. Maybe maybe I'm more on the side of the emperor in this in this argument. <laughs> um, would you want to write in that in that universe again? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I've I've written a whole bunch of novels in the Warhammer. You've written my favorite world. books in it. You've written my oh, favorite two books. There you go. The The Ambassador Chronicles. Mm. Uh, where yeah, the... I, I, I'd, I had a blast. Caspar van Velten. Yeah, I I, I I really enjoyed those books. But yeah, I if I mean I, I love the old world. I've written a whole bunch of novels in that setting. Yeah. I was very sad when the when the world ended and chaos blew everything up. Uh, so yeah, if it's the opportunity, chaos. if the opportunity came along to write something in the old world, absolutely, I, I love, I love that setting. So yes, would be the obvious, easy answer to that one. Yeah, I, I, I heard on uh, Bookspot Central the uh, the podcast you did in two thousand twelve and around May that you reread the Ambassador duology. It's one of the only books that you've reread, and I wanted to ask because you didn't yeah. elaborate why. Why did you reread them? What was what made you want to read them? Do you remember? No, it's been a while. Yeah, no, it's it's that's, a, that's an easy answer that one because most times, if I go back to anything I've read, it's usually just to confirm a thing that I've written because I'm doing something else. You know, like a Uriel Ventress novel. I'm, you know, what did mm. I say in the Swords of? You know, from right when I was writing Swords of Calth, I had to go back to the Chapters Due and Warriors of Ultramar to confirm. Oh yeah. It's his left hand that that happens in, or he's got this piece of equipment, or he said that to this character, ah, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. Whereas the Ambassador books, there's, there wasn't anything I needed. I've, I've never needed to go back to there to check something. I, well, actually, I think at the time I said that in the podcast, there wasn't. But then I did a, uh, I did a, a story for the End Times called uh, with, with Ice and Sword. It was the, sort of the final, final hurrah of Kislev. Uh, so I did go back. I had to go back to that. But as a story, it was one that I I loved writing. It was one of the, the one of the the two novels actually it was Ur the Ambassador and Urson's Teeth were the yeah. two novels that I had I had such fun writing them because it was a setting because 
a lot of the times when I'm when I was doing a Warhammer novel, I would choose I would what I was going to do based on a kind of almost like a state of the union kind of audit almost where I would look at the kind of characters, the kind of settings, the kind of stories we had and look for the gaps, look for the places right. that we hadn't explored hugely the you know, so we didn't have we hadn't set a lot of stories in Kislev. So that was a, and had that whole sort of Cossack era vibe Russian fantasy setting just I love it. It's you right can see why head. I like that, right? <laughs> yes, I can <laughs> indeed, yes. It's, so, it's got it plays into a lot of that, and I, I the kind of character as well. You know, we had hmm. most of our characters tended to, to be on the younger side. They tended to be this yeah. the heroic side yeah. of the the burly, you know, fighter or the bounty hunter, or the witch hunter, that sort of thing. So the idea of taking a main character who was this older guy who was kind of been put out to pasture in yeah in a far off land to sort of get him out of the way to live out the last part of his career in obscurity felt like something that we hadn't seen before in in Warhammer particularly again, and then again so yeah, that is putting him in a place yeah. where he was you oh, know the cool. he was the fish out of water and he was the guy if on paper he's probably the last person you would want in that situation to help save the day which is often you know a, a rubric I use when developing characters for stories is like okay who's the worst person to put in this situation to try and save the day you know we're up in a you know, we're telling a story up in the mountains. Okay, let's get somebody who's afraid of heights. We're telling a story <laughs> of somebody solving a mystery in a submarine. Okay, they're claustrophobic or that kind of, you know, that's simplistic, but, you know, you, you find ways to Hold heighten on, let the me drama just write by, that down. Just gonna, just you know, write this, heighten the drama by finding down. ways to just really turn the pressure up at every yeah, step yeah. of the story for the character and having him in that moment felt like a, it would offer me great opportunities for drama. I gotta say, mystery beneath the sea on a submarine with someone who's claustrophobic sounds like an awesome short story or a book idea. So, Graham, unless well, you're gonna write it, well, if you if you want to watch the, the BBC TV show called Vigil, which Vigil, okay. that's basically the plot of that. Uh, it's a murder mystery on a damn. submarine. <laughs> yeah, Saran Jones is this the cop who has to go down and hates oh, damn. that sort of thing, and it's it's very good. I would recommend it if you haven't seen it. Yeah, it's. I wanted to say that one of the reasons why, well, probably the two two reasons why I really liked Ambassador. You can feel you're having fun, Graham. You mm -hmm. you can feel on in the book that this is something that you're enjoying to write, and that it's it's it's. I don't know. Was it easy for you? Because it feels like it was easy. It feels like it was just coming out of you. Uh, was it well, the case? That, you know, that's, that's the that's the trick, isn't it, to make it look easy? You know, um, uh -huh. you know, but any you know, as you, I'm sure you all know yourselves that making writing look effortless is a lot of effort. Um, and yeah, I, I think that one yeah. did come out because I, I know this, I know that sort of that, the era of that sort of Cossack era, you know, Russia is, is one that I'm, I, I'm familiar with that history. I've read a lot of stuff about it. So cool. I didn't have to go too deep in down the rabbit hole because I could bring a lot of that from my own knowledge. The, the character had a lot of, you know, there's a lot of similarities to me, so I didn't have to deep, dig too deep uh, in that. You know, minus the heroic military background, one which, of course, I don't have. Um, but yeah, you know, I think being able to have fun with your story is hugely important because you can, I, I feel you can always tell when an author is really enjoying and into their story and they love, by the, the end result, they love what has come out, hopefully. And if somebody's just kind of phoning it in, you can tell. Uh, so yeah, For that sure. you're you're absolutely right. I did have a ton of. I mean, I haven't. There's not really. I haven't written any books where I've had a horrible time writing it. I've had books that were really, ch really challenging to write. Books that fought me at every turn because I didn't know quite where I was going or what was happening in it. But yeah, I've always had fun with them. Even even the most challenging books I've written have been fun ultimately. Because if it's not fun, like what are we even doing here? Can yeah, I'd like to ask you a question, Graham. Um, mm. Not so much about any particular genre, but about reading in general. Uh, yeah. I've I've argued with Nikki a lot about this. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> I, right. I think that there is such a thing as reading a story the wrong way, and I'm guilty about this myself. Uh, for example, the reason I didn't enjoy your um, 
what's it called? Two kinds of fool. Correct. Yeah. It's because I'll be bringing that up. <laughs> I read it the wrong way. Now Nikki read it the right way, and therefore he enjoyed it, and I didn't. Um, now I believe that that is true. That you can read a story the wrong way, uh, but he doesn't. He thinks that it's, it's nonsense. Yeah. So can you adjudicate <laughs> between us? Oh God. Um. I'm not. It depends. Uh, I think how. I mean, I, I, I like to spend proper amounts of time if I'm going to read anything. I don't like doing things in like little choppy chunks, that because I feel I feel you lose the emotional thread of a story. So I like to, you know, if I'm going to read something, I'm like, I'll get my cup of coffee. I'm going into the other room, and I yeah. sit and take the time to enjoy the book. So. That's you know I, I reading it, I always prefer reading on paper as opposed to reading on a screen because I think the the interaction you have and the relationship you have with the physical format of the book is different. Uh, the way I take in the words and interpret them and parse them from page to brain is different than I do when I take it on a screen, and I, I I maintain it in my brain a lot more when I read it on paper as a screen. Don't get me wrong, I'm not against ebooks. I have read plenty of books on my iPad and so on. Um, I don't know. I'm not sure what we would construe the wrong way to read a book beyond reading it in snippets or, you know, reading it. No, in no. What I, mean is, in... I think there's something lacking in one's own mental processes that mean that some people can't enjoy certain stories. Now I trust Nikki Zuev because I know he's, uh, uh, an intelligent man and he's got a properly functioning brain and if he enjoys a story that means that story has that virtue of being enjoyable and if mm -hmm. I can't enjoy it that means that there's something lacking in here which no, is I, I, that I would disagree with because I think Let's taste go. plays a no no taste plays a part as well there's you know I don't think necessarily like two people might read the same story and one might enjoy it and one might not and i don't know that that's necessarily always a failing of the story it might be but it could also be that say nikki's taste in books or story types of stories that he enjoys may differ wildly from what you might enjoy or you know x you might enjoy so well that's the you know like whenever i see a movie and i i, I almost I, I never even if i if it if i think it's, i didn't like it I, I wouldn't say this is a bad film it's usually i would say this film isn't for me you know yeah think, you know i have my own taste i have my own things that i like to read my own things i like to write and i try and say this to the kids all the time is like when they, they watch something or they see something they go, oh it's rubbish and you're like oh no it's <laughs> just because you don't like something doesn't mean it's bad no i you know, know. It, i absolutely agree mm -hmm. the thing is that this this talk of tastes in my opinion, is just labelling the problem. I think there's an enormous mystery here why people mm -hmm. have some tastes and others don't. And that's what I'm getting at. I'm saying that if if one had perfect taste, one could enjoy everything. Well, I, perfect taste, is there even such a thing? Because, you well, know, like I say, I like to know. think of myself as well-read, reasonably intelligent and so on. But there are books I have read that other people have raved about that I've gone... Really? Okay, I'm not that... seeing what you're seeing clearly, <laughs> and vice versa. There's books or films or TV shows or art or music that I, I love and other people despise. And mm. our tastes, you know, it's not just a, the taste in the moment. Our tastes go, are formed, you know, years and years ago in our, our past. You know, maybe you you had to read some, you know, some Shakespeare that you, that what you weren't ready for, so you hated it. So now, going forward, I don't like this style of storytelling, whereas you might have read, you know, like, we were, I was talking to a friend on Friday, actually, that, you know, the first the first Shakespeare that I read was Julia, uh, was, yeah, Macbeth, sorry, it was Macbeth. Macbeth, and let's go. That was, you know, murder, betrayal, witches, magic, prophecy. It was so far up my alley. I loved it. And, oh, mm -hmm. you know, Oh, hang on, I'll, my 
daughter's alarm clock is going off for some reason. Is, is that coming through in your audio? It's ringing a little sound. bit. Yeah. yeah, it's not that uh, that bad. I have a theory no. before you finish your story uh, about Macbeth. Uh, I have a theory. Maybe the perfect taste exists within a child's mind. And then they get to experience something through either someone reading to them or experiencing the very first sort of like inklings of something and they mm -hmm. begin to get attracted towards that. Mm -hmm. So it's this malleable thing that the perfect taste gets destroyed by whatever they start. Oh, they're, they're a blank, they're, a, you know, tabula rasa, they're a blank canvas. They, they don't have taste at mm -hmm. that point until it, they gravitate to things that they like and how those tastes and likes are formed. I are better minds than I would need to just, you know, investigate. <laughs> Yeah. And sometimes, what were you going to say? Oh, sorry, go on. Yes, go on. sometimes one's own tastes change radically. Like, oh, absolutely. Uh, typical example, me, when I first read Clark Ashton Smith, I thought, ugh, I don't like this at all. don't like the style <laughs> at all. And now he's one of my favourite authors. Uh, yes, I've never heard you talk taste, about Clark Ashton Smith before. Taste, taste is, really is absolutely a movable. No doubt about it. Yeah. Well, uh, what were you going to say about uh, Macbeth, uh, Graham? You were you were trying to well, just the, it was it was something that I it was one of my the first my first brush with Shakespeare was Macbeth yeah so and I loved it and it was it was you know because I'd been into my fantasy stuff so uh, before this so uh, this play was right up my alley in terms of the bloodshed and then we you know in class we watched the the movie version of it and it was the the Roman Polanski uh, version of Macbeth and it was blood and guts and magic and you know. It was great. I yeah. loved it because uh, I was, you know, I was I, I, like one of my favorite films is Excalibur, you know, John Berman's movie, and it it visually and thematically goes to some very similar places. So mm -hmm. that formed. I, I to me, this is like, oh, this this is what Shakespeare is. is blood and guts and violence. I love it. You know, to my you know <laughs> young, very young brain at the time. And then yeah, I, yeah. you know, we did we did Hamlet and Julius Caesar. We did all the, did a bunch of the tragedies early on. Uh, and it's like, yes, this guy, this guy's amazing. I love his stuff. But then, yeah. you know, then we did you know, uh, Romeo and well, also one of the tribes, Romeo and Juliet and Midsummer Night's Dream and Twelfth Night and all these things. And by that point, I'd, I knew enough, my taste had formed to love the language, uh, the, the pacing and how they were written. So that when I encountered ones that might have been more challenging to my younger brain to go, I like this. I was primed and ready to enjoy those kinds of stories, that kind of language. Whereas if it had been the other way around, if I'd maybe done, you know, much ado about nothing first, I might have bounced off it a little bit. And then would I have encountered those other stories and read them yeah. and loved them as much as I did? Mm. So, you know, it's, it's very, I think, it, very dependent on your first encounters with styles of fiction and writers as to how your taste can be formed, you know, like, cause we, you know, we've read to our, we read to our kids from the very, very earliest age. And they are, you know, they, they love their books. They love stories. They love storytelling. Yeah. My youngest is writing, uh, writing a novel just now. So and they're, it's, in, it's very much, uh, you know, I, I can say, I can see, you know, the, the origins of my reading and writing and storytelling, I can see the seeds of it in their writing now because of the style of books we have read to them, the style of books they have then picked out for themselves and so on. Mm. So, yeah, I think taste is such a subjective thing. It's formed early and it is by no means a fixed thing at mm. all. But it's it's it means the argument is asymmetrical. It is between very two much people, so. One of who likes one of whom likes a book and the other one doesn't. It seems to me that the one who likes it is necessarily has the better of the argument simply because you for the same reason you can't prove a negative also you can't say well you may think that you're enjoying this book but actually <laughs> you know i did say that about they didn't yeah. I? enjoying it sort of thing yeah, yeah. and that, that that argument is one of the ones that i don't think you know if somebody enjoys something it's like there's no way to you you can't and nor should you say well actually you're wrong you didn't enjoy it because of x y and z if you enjoyed it you enjoyed it full stop you know okay. yeah there's, i don't there's, there's no such thing as a guilty pleasure i know? don't i don't pleasures. see why i don't see why anyone has to justify what they like or don't like no 
Yeah. You know, like you know, it's like the the old well, meme and you know, he's holding somebody's lips shut and he's like, Let people like the things they like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I think for Absolutely. this for this pod for this podcast we kind of have to explain why we like or don't like No, no, and, and when there's right? when there's like a critiquing and an yeah. analysis of a story, you can yeah, absolutely. You know, you can, that's, and it's entirely valid to not like a story, you know, or to say yeah. this is not for me because it didn't, you know, d- didn't do things that I look for in a story. It didn't have the kind of characters that I like or, you know, would want to root for, or, you know, it did. It does all the things I like. You know, yeah. it's, you know, we're all complex beasts in terms of the things we do and don't like about all things, be they art, music, writing, whatever. So did you have a little bit more con- context, uh, context to the situation, Graham? Um, about six or seven months ago, we reviewed a story uh, where this debate between me and Robert has begun. And the saga you know, was akin to the Siege of Terror, you know. It would occasionally come back, there would, there would be back and forth, the entire worlds exploded as we argued against... Uh, one another and i would never have thought that the ending would be that graham mcneil if you told me six six months ago that graham mcneil would weigh in on this argument <laughs> i would have said you're crazy but that's that's what happened you know that's world, life man world is, comes exactly. at you fast oh god all right um i wanted to uh replicate the the twitter biopic that you've got that and i bought especially an iron brew for this <laughs> right so um, Oh, you make me jealous now. <laughs> it is so hard to get in Germany. I had to go through free stores. Uh, what Try about getting in, in America? America. Yeah, okay. God. To be uh, fair, there is, a, there is a British shop, the Ye Olde King's Head down in Santa Monica, where you can go and get your British fix of pies and crumpets and what have you, if you're willing to pay like three times the price. Well, Graham, I don't want to, you know... Put put any salt on the wound, but it does taste pretty good. <laughs> it does. It's 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 God's own nectar. Um, it's ambrosia. Ambrosia. There we go. That is a beautiful way to say it. So you've done a lot of uh, tie-in novels, and by a lot, I'm not even sure. Have you ever done a non-tie-in something, a short story uh, that is not connected to a different? Yeah, I mean, short stories. Yes, and yeah, novels stories, have all yes. been part of franchises. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've done a few, yeah. <laughs> However, I know that when you were in college, you had a book one of a series that you were starting to work on, uh, of almost finished, and then you sort of went and you started working with White Dwarf, right? And you mm-hmm. started writing reports, doing journalism, then you did a bunch of stuff with... I'm not a stalker, I promise. And then uh, you started, you know... <laughs> You've done your research. I, a little bit. Um, you know, you started working on a bunch of mechanics, uh, which I also want to ask you about some RPG stuff, because as a mm-hmm. dungeon master, I, I have a couple of questions. But you said in the same interview uh, in, in uh, Box Spot uh, Central, the same one I talked uh, about earlier, that um, you use some of those aspects from that tale in, mm-hmm. in your novels now in, 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 in Warhammer. Do you regret yeah. that? Do you do you regret that you never made this? No, story? no, because it was no? a it was a forty k novel, the one that I pillaged what? for bits. So no, it, it, you it heard was it here a, first. It was <laughs> a, the, the the novel I wrote while I was at university, um, the one I have pillaged bits of and then have used, you know, waste no part of the animal style in other books and short stories I've written. It was a for, it was a forty k story no anyway so it was it wasn't anything that i would have used elsewhere so you wrote fan fiction basically, basically yeah. at the time i, I, wrote, okay. I wrote a novel when i was at university and who was the main character it was, the main a, character it was a dark angel called uriel ventress oh. uh, that uh, different i came universe. to write a, a novel for bl my first bl novel was an ultramarines one um yeah. and i loved the name uriel ventress so he Became a Yenoxian Marine. Man. Uh, by the way, the fact that the, the fact that you keep lying in every interview that you like the Ultramarines, I, I feel like I you did. know you're no really... lie there, no <laughs> lies detected. I'm, j- I'm, joking. Check, I'm joking. Check the shelf there. Yeah. Full of Ultramarines. I know, I know, check, but it's you know oh, hold two on. blade guards in, in progress. Oh my god. Yeah, so how 
<laughs> How do you force yourself? No, I'm kidding. Why do you like the Ultramarines? Now, you've said before that it's like, oh, it's because of, you know, their historical value and because mm -hmm. they're, they're kind of like into, you know, the Imperium and, and doing things the, the right way and that you can tell stories about people who, you know, uh, who are that way that can be interesting. But now, after writing for so long, 2002, it's been 21 years, Graham, mm -hmm. right? You've written for them for 21 years. What is there more to find appealing now that you've had 20 years with that chapter? You know, what can you say that like, okay, now I've definitively understand that this part is, is really mm -hmm. what speaks to me. Well, it's not so much about the Ultramarines, it's about the characters within mm. the Ultramarines and finding who they are and what their relationship is with the Imperium now that, you know, things have shifted in the 40k universe. And with with Yuri Ventures himself, he he's crossed the Rubicon Primaris, and he's now a Primaris Marine. So he has a whole bunch of new challenges ahead of him in terms of adapting to his new physiology, his new place within the, the chapter. Uh, what, you know, because the galaxy has shifted, like Gulliman is now awake. The Indomitus Crusade is underway. The... The Cicatrix Maledictum is splitting the galaxy in half. There's the the situation they find themselves in is completely different from when I started telling stories of the Ultramarines. So the opportunities for the kinds of stories that I can tell are always have been, but even more so, you know, basically limitless. You know, it's how how those because every story is about relationships. The best stories are about the relationships between the characters and people in and around their orbits, and the world that they are living in now has shifted on its axis, so it's completely different. So that how they perceive the world going forward has changed, and the enemies they will face, the allies they will have, are entirely different from when I first started with them. So uh, to me, there's just so much more to explore, so much more depth to find within those characters and their relationships, because how Uriel and Pisanius and Learchus and the rest of the Swords of Calth, their relationships have changed over the years by triumph, by loss, by change. So I don't see any problem with finding new depths to explore in the, the characters and the emotional journeys, because you know, yeah, I've told a lot of stories about the Ultramarines. I, I really enjoy that chapter, and I think there's still a ton of interesting things to tell with the characters as much as anything else, and how they are informed by their chapter's history, its regulations, its dogma, whatever. You know, that might not change as such, but who the characters are is constantly changing in relation to themselves, to each other, and the wider world around them. So there's to my mind, there's tons more stories to tell, and I, you know, I fully intend to, you know, go back and do more with them because the Swords of Calth is very much a, a novel designed to bring new readers into the fold because it's been a, it's been a right. while since I've done a Uriel novel, so it was, a, it was a novel designed to bring new readers in, and also provide a jumping off point for new and further adventures of. So yeah, I there's plenty more to be told. From those from those characters, oh, and, and I, I, just, I do. I, I still I love the history. I love the iconography. I love the look of them. I love the way. Love they, the toilet seat. I, <laughs> I, I do, I'm a big fan of Ultramarines. Always have been, and I I love telling stories that because I think for the Ultramarines you can yeah. you have to rely on the characters rather yeah. than a, a, a kind of gimmicky thing, and that's that sounds yeah. reductive, but you know it's like. Well, space wolves are Vikings in space. Blood angels are vampires. Dark yeah. angels are monks with a terrible secret. You know, it's like the Ultramarines are. You know, they're the Roman legions in space. I mean, there's there's a thousand novels with the Roman legions and Roman characters doing stuff in the world, but you know, sure, we don't yeah. see any need to stop telling those stories. So, I think there's yeah, plenty yeah. more to be told with them. Yeah, and I love. Them. I mean, it. Unapologetically. I, it is my... Unapolog you are unapologetically love them, and I am only I joking. Um, I know. You know. I have a. I know. I, I have a very special connection to the to those books, uh, which I'll, I'll discuss maybe a little bit later. But uh, actually, you had some questions, didn't you? Or, or are they all gone? Uh, no, <laughs> no. Said actually, okay. actually, so 
So um, you you went in at length into how it felt to be working on a series for seventeen years and then mm. having to end it and see it through. And I kind of feel not to that not obviously not to the depth that you had because I worked for five years in Clone Wars and when my time on that was over, it was it was very much. I'm glad it's over, but damn, I really miss <laughs> I really mm. miss my time on it and so yeah. and so sort of I, I i'm using that to lead into what it what is it like writing for an established uh series like warhammer do you have mm -hmm. um it's back in lucas we literally had a guy that is like the law master mm -hmm. <laughs> he sits in a room with tons of books behind him and is that something that um uh, you you can share with us like what is it like to yeah. be a writer in an established universe and what sort of things do you have to go through when you yeah. bounce ideas off yeah. each other? I think I think what made it different in terms of for us and the the Horus Heresy team especially, uh, and for a lot of the the writers for Forty K is that we were, and this sounds like such a cliche, but we are fans of the universe first. You know, I played Warhammer, I collected figures for years and years and years before I came to work for Games Workshop, before I started writing novels for them. You know, I love this universe. I've been immersed in this universe since I was like 16 years old. Uh, I am steeped in it. You know, if if you cut me, I will bleed chaos energy onto the table. You know, I love this universe and always have done. So that's Kind of what brings me back to the table every time, because uh, I, I enjoy. I, I'm a fan. I enjoy reading the other guys' stories. I enjoy writing my own ones and putting my spin on it. We we had access to the studio in terms of resource for you know canonicity and so on, but we all kind of knew it anyway. Everybody who was in that heresy room and a lot of the writers, we've been steeped in it for many many years, so we know a lot of the, the lore inside out. And if we don't, wait, sure, wait, wait, there's always wait, somebody wait. within it, the studio what, to ask. Was there really a room called the Heresy Room? Well, whenever we would get together to have a, you know, a writers' room, we were always in the the boardroom, and that was just known as the Heresy Room. Yeah, it was Damn. big, long table, lots of white boards. And did you guys you know, ever yeah, come we... in and like pretend to be Primarchs? <laughs> We've got well, to obviously, I mean, if you're not if you're not pretending to be Primarchs and do pew 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 noises when you're pitching a story idea, then you're wasting your time. Um, but yeah, no, we, did, you you know, we had we had rooms. We had the room, the heresy room that we'd go into. You would, you know, at, at, the, at the heyday of it, we would meet maybe four or five times a year. We'd all gather in the room and we'd, you know, again we'd say, okay, where are we at in the story? What are the what are the arcs we're going to tell over the next couple of years? How many books is that? Who's you know we'd figure out what the attempt you know what the interest of each particular storyline was, and luckily you know there was no re there was no overlaps in terms of you know like fist fights as to who got to tell tell which particular story, and it was it was, it was a brilliant experience because the you know you were in a room with you know it was like Dan Abnett, Gav Thorpe, Jim Swallow, Chris Ray, Aaron Dembski Bowden. Guy Haley, you know, Nick Kime, and you know, editors and art and, and Neil Roberts as well. So it was a, a real uh a real melting pot of just depth of experience in the room. And we all knew the lore so well. Like Gav had worked at Gav and I had worked there for for many, many years. Gav for a lot longer than I had. So the depth of knowledge of the IP there was already vast in terms of right. understanding what stories we could tell and what things meant in the IP so we, we never really had a need of anyone to tell us what the IP was although if we want you know sometimes the direction the studio would be going in terms of you know their product and their lines would dictate like okay you have to steer away from this because we're going to do a, a system for this or a, a product for that and that was fine that was all that was all part of the dance when you're working in an established IP that is based on a you know, a product, like a game and the miniatures and so on, you are ultimately beholden to that. And that was fine because, you know, both entities fed off each other and supported one another. So it was a nicely symbiotic relationship. So it was it was a lot of fun, to be fair. Uh but yeah, it was no no it was no difficulties in it at all. 
Oh. We we were given a fairly free oh. hand in terms of developing on, the story. Having that, I've got, I've got a question. Hold on, I've got a question. It's very quick. There, I know, I know it wasn't a fist fight, but I know there was a you and Dan Abnett. You had a discussion about who was gonna write Prospero Burns and who's gonna write A Thousand Suns. A Thousand Suns, for which you got the New York's bestseller, mm -hmm. by the way. So well done yeah, for choosing A Thousand Suns. It, it wasn't. It wasn't so much a discussion. It was more. Right events overtook us uh, in the sense mm. of when we were originally doing the planning for it. Uh, I mean, the, the books didn't have titles at that point, but in the original planning right. for it, the idea was that he would tackle the Thousand Suns and I would do the Space Wolf. And the more we talked about what the stories were, who the characters were, what kind of thematics we'd be running through it, who each particular Legion was, the more we talked about it, the more we found our our particular interests were sort of going like this to the point where oh. we just sort of went, do you want, should we just switch? Because it was quite <laughs> clear, I think, that I had the the real affinity for the Thousand Suns and Dan was from a place of, I don't really get the, the Space Wolves to a place of, actually, I fucking love these guys. I really, I want to dig into who they are and we kind of just right. thought, let's just, let's just swap over then. So right, it wasn't really I knew a... You... You had a lot of um, research done towards the occult and esoteric arts and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I guess you used a yeah. lot of that for the Thousand Suns. Definitely. I mean, the only thing that was the, the, the only switch that was kind of forced upon us was that uh, Dan ultimately had his book was supposed to come out first, but ultimately he had some health issues that delayed, you know, his writing process to the point where like look, we're just going to switch them over. Uh, so ultimately, that that was the only you know discussion that we had in terms of who was doing what and when it would come out. That his his health issue with his epilepsy meant that my book was going to be ready to come out way before his Prospero Burns one. But as far as the subject matter, it was more. It was just like a as we discussed what the story and the characters were, we kind of realized that we were both kind of telling the wrong story, and we needed to tell each other's one. And that was awesome. something that came out organically from the, the development of the story. For sure. Okay. Sorry that I hogged the mic there, actually. But I really wanted to ask that one. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to leave what I want to say unsaid. No, I'm just oh. kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Um, um, so it really sounded like you had fun with uh, just writing in the Warhammer universe with all your fellow. Yeah, uh, and yeah, because there's one thing I'll I'll just quickly interject on that one mm -hmm. that we absolutely did because the the people that I worked with on this Horus Heresy project were are were and remain some of the most creative, talented, wonderful people I've ever worked with. I mean, I would work you know if the opportunity to be in a room to work something with those guys again came up i would be there in a heartbeat because we had it was a, such a collegial collaborative process that with you know just the right of ego amount of ego in the room to be pitching your ideas thinking that what you were pitching was good but if a better idea came along you'd be like, cool let's go that way you know it was a it was a truly collaborative atmosphere where everybody was pitching in ideas building on each other's ideas. Uh, yeah, and it was brilliant. I loved it. It was, it was a fun process to develop the stories as much as it was to write them. I really feel that because right now the show I'm working on, which I can't talk about, um, I've, got, <laughs> I've got the freedom to, to, to inject a lot of my stuff in and it's mm -hmm. such a great feeling. It's like really uh, rare in a franchise. Oh. When you, when you feel that empowered to create yeah. and be trusted, that's exactly. an amazing feeling. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to ask you, so uh, y you wrote your first novel, Nightbringer, in about mm -hmm. five months. And I'm thinking to myself, that is that is pretty I, quick. That is really I was, quick. I, no, that was, that was probably about three months I wrote that one in. <laughs> Three months. Oh, right. Stop showing the, off, yeah. <laughs> no, no, but I, the, the caveat to that is I would not recommend doing it the way because I was working. I still I was working. I had a full time job at the time, as so I was doing my you know my nine to five, and working at the evenings and the weekends and so on. And I, and I wrote it very quickly. But by the same token, I would highly not recommend that pace for it because by the end of that three months, I was burned out to hell. I was exhausted. I was working, 
you know, till the wee small hours of the morning, a few hours sleep, up for work, do a day's work, get home, and then work all evenings. And so I, it was, it was my first novel, so I didn't know any better. Um, but yeah, I, it was very quickly written. But yeah, I would not recommend doing it that quickly for anyone listening. Uh, still, a, still an achievement, I have to admit. Um, hmm. Just uh, based on my own writing speed, I'm like, oh. I got a lot of you mean based on our writing speed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh well uh, my own too. My own too. Okay. But this mm-hmm. leads to my um uh question actually. And what do you yeah. think is um what do you think is a goodly amount of time for a professional writer to be pumping out books? Uh a good time is whenever your deadline Everyone. tells you is a good time. <laughs> Do you set a that deadline you know, for you, yourself? Uh, well, you know, when I sign a contract to write a book, there's always right, a deadline right. on there. Um, when I was when I was full time freelancing and writing novels as my daily bread and butter, it would, yeah, I mean, from conception to delivery was usually around about four four and a half to five months, at, at, give or take, uh, depending on what else is going on, because. Which sound it does, yeah, I, I agree that does sound quick, but then when that's your full time job and you know, I you know, I'd write I would treat my freelance schedule like a day job. You know, I'd get up in the morning, get breakfast, take the kids to school, get to work. And, you know, I'd I'd work and then I would have lunch and I would work and then I would go and pick up the kids or whatever. So I, I it was a job, you know, I and not to sound, you know, like oh it's, it's you know, writing, it's art, blah, blah, whatever. No, it was, it was a job. I treated it like this is my day job. This pays my mortgage. I need to show up every day, get my arse in the chair and put words in the page. And if you're looking at, you know, if you do, say, 1,500, 2,000 words a day, give or take. You know, some days it'll be less, some days it might be more. But as long as you're showing up most days and doing that amount of work, just by pure arithmetic, you'll get your novel done in about three to four months. Um, that does rely a little bit on some good planning and, and discipline. You know, as a freelance writer with deadlines, if you're not disciplined, you will not get the words done. And if you're not disciplined and don't get the words done, nobody will hire you because being reliable when you're a freelance writer with deadlines for a publisher, missing deadlines is about the worst thing you can do. Being unprofessional in your delivery is, in my head anyway, is I think it's like the, the the sin of the right, the worst sin of the writer is missing your deadline or, and at least, or at least not telling your editor that you're going to miss the deadline and then, you know, ghosting them for weeks and what have you. Absolutely. So, you hear that, George R. R. Martin? <laughs> Sorry, I just yeah. to get that being reliable out. is a huge plus to any publisher. If they know you yeah. can deliver, they will be more likely to come to you again and again and again. Yeah. Uh, so so... For, for me, I, I just to sustain the life mm. that we had in terms of paying the mortgage, having a car, putting the kids in daycare at that time, and you know, okay, you know, if we wanted a holiday or fix something in the the, the house that was broken, whatever, you know, I the, it was a matter of I learned that my first six months of being a freelancer was brutal in terms of. The, the amount of work I took on, the deadlines I set myself, the, um, the sheer volume, and it taught me a lot about what I needed to do to pay the bills and survive, what I could do, and what I should, or in a lot of cases, should not do. So, you know, to, I needed to do roughly, I needed to, do, to write at least two novels a year, plus associated short stories, and get a third one underway. And if I could do that over the course of a year, then that would pay my bills and do all the things that you know you need to exist in the world as a human being that needs money to survive. So, if if if, if in an ideal world, say if somebody said, "Right, okay, we're going to pay all your bills for you. Everything's going to be taken care of. Here's a novel. We just want you to write it, and you could give me absolute free reign and no pressure to to write it." You know, I would still give myself deadlines because I, I, I feel you need that. You need to be able to have a deadline or milestones or goals to hit along the way to feel to feel you're making progress, to actually make progress, to get your little dopamine hit of hitting 
halfway mark, three quarter mark, whatever. Um, they mo deadlines motivate me to to get the work done. But if if you were saying like, here's this project, deliver it whenever you want, I would. And if it was a regular hundred thousand word mass market paperback, roughly, I would probably want to take four to five months, give or take, to go from conception to delivery. Time. Yeah, and like if I was full time, time, yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, when you've got a day job, obviously that time scale has to be extended because, you know, you're going to be working evenings, weekends, and if you have obligations to family, friends, children, then time scales have to become flexible and you have to adapt to that, you know, because we had, I was in the middle of writing A Thousand Sons when uh, our first son arrived. So, you know, that book became split into two halves of the, the first half before child, second half after child. <laughs> and my writing schedule very much had to adapt to the fact that we had a small child in the house and we were all exhausted for long periods of the day. But yeah, that, I'd say I would feel antsy if I was taking longer than that, because a, a book to me lives and dies by its momentum. You know, if you can maintain a good, solid, exciting momentum pushing the ball forward, even if that ball being pushed forward is by a tiny amount or a large amount, doesn't matter. As long as you're pushing it forward on a regular basis, not necessarily every day, but as long as you're pushing words on the page forward, then you keep the momentum going. So I think if taking any longer than that, I feel I would start to feel that was bleeding off that momentum and I would find it harder to get you know, overcome the inertia of the slowing or the pause to really push the pace to the end. So that four to five months feels like a, for me, it feels like a good pace. Uh, you know, ask 10 authors, you'll get 10 different answers. What would be a, a natural time? I mean, that's that's a fantastic answer. I have to admit, this is, it's a bit of more of a selfish answer uh, question that I'm asking because I want to get a idea of uh, how much words should I be yeah. putting into paper? But Really, but you should never, never base it on any. You know, take inspiration from other people's answer to that question. But I would never feel beholden to it. Like, well, Ab Graham said it should be done in four or five months, absolutely. and if I don't do it by then, then I'm a slacker and I'm useless and I shouldn't do this anymore. It's like, no, 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 no absolutely no. not. Absol uh, absolutely, book takes as long yeah. as it takes. Absolutely. You know? uh, well, no, to, to, to no Graham, I am, Gandalf, I am but... useless, and I will never write again. Yeah, Thank you so much for your. You know, <laughs> a, a book arrives precisely when it means to. No, it's uh, it's oh, good to have. Gandalf. It's good. So from okay. So so I I so um, I so feel I so feel what you just said because I also have to work with deadlines on my day job, mm -hmm. and I also feel like yep. if I'm not delivering, I need to tell my editors why. Or not my editor, but my supervisors uh, yep. why I'm not um, able to it. give it to yeah. them. And if I fail, I feel really bad. I feel like I've let them. Oh, I, I hate letting people down if yeah. I agree to deadline. I, 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 hate I feel, it. more importantly, I feel really unprofessional. And I, I, and I do take mm -hmm. pride as a professional. And so yep. your Good. answer was very, very, very useful for me because now I have a sort of an idea of, uh, of uh, actually how much more <laughs> I need to write. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, know, you so much. Everybody's pace is different. Everybody, like I know, I know plenty of writers who are way faster than I am. I know plenty of writers who are much, much slower than I am. Ultimately, to the reader, it doesn't really matter whether you did it in three months or nine months. As long as the finished product is something that you are happy to stand behind, it doesn't matter. As long as you feel that you have put the correct amount of effort, research, love, and time into it then the number is largely irrelevant as to how long it took. As long as you feel you've done your due diligence and the care and attention you've given to the writing, I don't care whether you took a year or two years or 10 years or six weeks to yeah. write it. doesn't matter. Very good answer. Thank you so much, Graham. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I will leave my last question to the last. Do you, have a, do you guys okay. have any more? I do. Uh, I've, I mean, I've got... Too many to ask, so I'm gonna pick and choose at this point. Uh, first of all, right, stupid question, but it's a fun question, so why okay. not? Um, 
if you were so unfortunate as to tomorrow to be reborn within the Warhammer 40,000 universe, <laughs> who would you least likely to hate to be? Least likely to hate to be? Yeah, because I mean, like, I don't okay. think you can love your existence in Warhammer 40,000, right? Unless you're literally, um, like, on a pleasure Unless, island. unless you're, like, the planetary governor on a pleasure planet, then... Yeah, exactly, that's what I'm talking about, yeah, yeah. But, like, um, like a real answer, right? Like, like a model, if I could call it Graham McNeil, right? Like, what is it? Okay, I'd probably be a happy little Hormigaunt. <laughs> You'd be, like, a Tyranid? I'd be just running along in the pack with all my mates, having fun, uh, chewing people up, eating them. <laughs> Have a, having what, a laugh. What was the game like yesterday? <laughs> yeah. yeah go you on, know, the, the Hormagons, they, they have, what cares do they have in the world to just run around with their pals, chomping things? Right. No worries yeah. at all. Fair, you know what? I think that is probably a better answer than I would have given. So I like, I like the idea. Um, the, um, a more serious question. You have written a lot about the Imperium. And mm -hmm. in... Uh, uh, and just put a paint to it, uh, which you did very recently in July. You did talk about like a that it's not like you've ever felt a calling to to write for somebody else, but you do really like Necrons, and you've got like an aspiration for the Dark Eldar. But you did say that it was hard to write for the Dark Eldar because of their nature, right? Because of uh, how how it's terrible they are. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, right. And if you were gonna write a book about them, you know, if you want to be true to it, it would have to be. You know, pretty. Explicit. Oh, it has to be full R rated, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so in the world, right? We're currently in the world where this those kind of projects do get green lit. I mean, look at the boys by Amazon Prime, mm -hmm. right? Like there is a there's a scene in the third season. I won't describe it, but I, basically, I, I've seen the third season, but right, ends, but the you one in the, the opening scene. the opening episode you're thinking of. Yes, that's right. The yeah, the tiny little guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. I, I don't know if this is the world anymore where a Dark Eldar um, book couldn't be done, right? Oh, no, no. I mean, is... they've been done. I mean, Andy Chambers did his Dark Eldar books. They've appeared in... I mean, I've used Dark Eldar characters in Nightbringer. Yeah, uh, no, that they yes. can absolutely be done. Yeah, for sure. But do you want to, is, is, my, is my question, knowing the current atmosphere? Yeah, the I mean, I, there's, there's very few aspects of the 40k universe, if even any, that wouldn't elicit an excited squee for me if the publisher came and said, hey, we'd love you to do a Necron novel, a Dark Eldar novel, a Tau novel, whatever. You know, because I've worked or written on, I don't think there's a single piece of the lore and the background that I haven't either written whole books on or used them in some capacity in a novel or a short story or a comic right. or something. So there's there's always a way in. I mean, that's the, th the thing, you know. It's, even if it's a faction that I might sort of scratch my head a little bit, going, "Okay, what's right, where's where's the story in these guys?" That to me is part of the fun of it. I mean, to go back to the Thousand Suns Prospero thing, like Dan originally was saying that you know he he didn't quite get the love people had for the space wolves. What it was what was it what was it about them that that drew people to this chapter that they loved so much? Because he didn't quite get it. So that drove him to dig in deeper to figure out who they are, what they are, what makes them tick, what's fun about it, what do people really dig about it, and that drove him to a place where he's like, I've, "Yeah, I love these guys now. I can, I can craft a story around these guys that I love myself, that will also appeal to people who already love the Space Wolves." So I think there's there's an element of that, even even parts of the the, the lore that I might not have the hugest affinity for, I can use that as fuel to find out why others do like it and why others love it and that's my way into the story uh so yeah there's 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 i don't i couldn't think of a single thing in our stories or ip that i wouldn't want to try at some point so sure i think a dark elf you know kind of dark politicking backstabbing betrayal story of you know, a Gormenghast like vibe to it would be a very cool story. You know, somebody, you know, you get a mix of gladiator, you know, somebody cast into the fighting pits of Kamara mm, and then, you know, yes. working their way out for revenge. You know, I am Maximus Aurelius Decimus, blah, blah, blah. Let's that go. would be fun. Yeah. You know, I, there's, there's always a way in, even if you can't see it at first, just by immersing yourself in it, you can find it. So, 
well, let's I, would, hope, I would do anything. Let's hope that happens, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I want to mm -hmm. read what you just said. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there is... Now I've got some personal questions because I got you here and uh, you can't escape now. Um, and you've gone for, fallen into the false sense of secu security, right? Because we're all normal people. Um, so I'm a dungeon master and I've been a dungeon master for a long time. I've been a dungeon master for about 15 years and I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons and all that kind of stuff um mm -hmm. for almost 20 years and i started at a very young age i was about six um and i heard that you had a wednesday night game with all mm -hmm. of the writers where you would run call of tool who fought them now and then i find out that it's third edition so how what what is the experience of writing oh not writing well but running a role-playing game for a bunch of authors Right? Is it is it a, is this a beautiful thing or is it like actually it's an amazing catastrophic? Thing. Oh, okay, go on. Oh, well, I mean, if you look at things like you know Critical Role and so on, where you've got a lot, bunch of voice actors doing these games, and they bring all their skill and experience and talent to bear in playing those characters, and it really brings the stories to life. And when your players are you know, authors and artists and creative types, they do the same. They bring their creativity and talent to the fore when they're playing their characters. And it, you know, there's no, there was never a sense, because we would, you know, we would rotate GMs through, depending what game we were playing. Um, there was never a sense of, oh my God, how could I run a game for so many talented people? It was like, no, that's brilliant. They're going to bring so much to this game that it makes it such a, a really special experience for all of us, you know, because I, I, I attended, I GM'd the Call of Cthulhu campaigns. I did a Serenity one. Uh, Bill did a 40k one. Mark did, Mark was our Dungeons Dragons guy. So we would, oh, okay. you know, the gaming night started, I mean, not long after I came to workshop start. So that started back in early, well, mid 2000, say. And it, I mean, the gaming group still goes to this day. I mean, I'm, I'm, obviously not there as often but uh you know I, I the power of zoom compels you um but yeah the gaming the webs the gaming group still going strong 20 odd years later and but while i was in nottingham we would meet every wednesday religiously and we would play role-playing games if if for whatever reason we couldn't get the right number of bodies then we would just get the board games out or the card games and yeah you know there was always gaming going on on a wednesday the, no matter if somebody couldn't make it that week or we didn't have enough to get the, the team together for the role playing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, it was always, it was always there on a Wednesday and playing with people who are creatives in our gaming circle was amazing. It brought so much more to the experience because everybody committed fully to bringing their own writing and artistic talents to bear and how they played their character. So it was, it was fantastic. I couldn't have, I could not have wished for a better bunch of people to play with. Did you ever take anything that was done on those sessions into your writing or at least felt tempted to? Because it was not, like, oh, this uh, well, I, I, I was going to say not really, but yes, that's because I, you know, I've, I've said this to anyone who will listen. I think one of the best trainings you can have as a writer is to be a dungeon master, is to run games of role playing. Because, you know, you've got the story idea of what you, you know, you've got the scenario you're playing, the the things you think, you know, the events you think are going to play out in that session. But, you know, all bets are off the minute the players enter the equation. Yeah. Because you, you have to maintain this, the collaborative storytelling with your players, giving them agency within the story to the, so that they can change the thing. You know, what you thought was going to happen might be out the window in the first minute of the play session. And you have to adapt to that, to adapt the story, to adapt the characters, the NPCs, the environment to what your players are doing. So as a storyteller, being able to quickly on the fly come up with new ways of telling the story or new elements to add to the story or take out of the story based on what your players are doing is incredibly useful training for a writer to teach you how to adapt a story when things don't quite go the way you expect them to. So when I'm outlining a story or when I'm writing a story, I'm always open to those newer, better, stranger ideas that I might not have thought of 
when I was outlining it at 30,000 feet, but now I'm in the weeds of telling the story. Shit, I need to... That's actually a much better idea, or this doesn't work, so I need to change it to make this. So DMing was a, a great exercise for me to train the muscles of you know your storytelling to be able to adapt better along the way. So in terms of actual storylines, no, no, I didn't take anything from our sessions, but I did a I did a trilogy of Lovecraftian novels for Fantasy Flight based in their Arkham Horror range, and a bunch of the characters who were in that novel are the guys who were in our campaign, our Cthulhu Whoa. campaign that we ran. So, uh, who's Morley who? Dean was uh, well, who's... the character Phil Kelly played uh, Morley Dean. He is one of the main characters in the books. Uh, William Hillshaw, the the English gent. There's a friend of mine, John Mickleback. He he is in the novel. So, yeah, those characters were directly you know inspired by the sessions that we played. Man, that's so cool. Um, I'm I'm currently writing a a book myself with with actually with sort of a a, a duo in crime when it comes to this book, and it is a behemoth of a thing. Um, it is it is taking its time in some in some aspects, and I've taken some of the aspects uh, from from my uh, you know um, from me running games, and I've put it into into the, mm-hmm. into the the book, and I found that like whenever I've taken something from my experience as a dungeon master it's actually the best points in the novel at least for me like i see them as like okay this is actually a really well, fun they're probably the bits that are the most alive because they were born yeah. out of those moments of the characters and the, the players know their characters better than anybody so their reactions to a moment to a scene to stress will be genuine the emotions there will be real and when that's translated into the book you're bringing that with you so that doesn't sure. surprise me at all. My yeah. childhood uh, favorite books was pretty much written that way. Um, Chronicles, Dra- uh, Dragonlance Chronicles. It was pretty much. Written oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like Raymond E. Feist's uh, Magician series was all based off his role playing uh, sessions with his fr- friends and so on. So there's yeah, there's there's great there's great value to that because there's an authenticity to the characters and their emotions and their arcs that. You know, it brings with it the, uh, a level of reality that you might not be able to have conceived of when you were just building them from scratch. You've mentioned in the same uh, interview that I keep coming back to. Honestly, I really love the interview with Bookspark Central. I think you were very mm-hmm. earnest and you had a, lot, a really good discussion with the with the interior. Um, and you spoke about your influences, and you did name you did name Robert E. Howard, but you didn't really spend that much time on it. Am I correct to assume that you, at, le- at least in the earlier ver- uh, works, tried to implicate the same type of action structure for your action scenes as Robert E. Howard? Or is that me just reading too much into it because I love Conan so much? The action scenes, not so much. It was like the the. the... It was more the the style of those stories, you know, the, the, the that epic, you know, days of high adventure kind of mm. vibe was what I wanted to try. That's what I took most from Robert E. Howard's thing, that sort of mythical past vibe to the, you know, the Hyboria was, you know, like an earlier age of man in our world sort of thing. The The action, the most, the writer I've taken the most from in terms of how the action would have been structured or written is probably David Gemmell. Um, because uh-huh. I I absolutely loved his books. I I've read them all multiple times, and how David Gemmell writes with a, a real there's a real clarity and brevity to his action, but it's still wonderfully characterful that I love, and it really spoke to me when I first read those books. And he's he maintained that all through his life when he was writing. Uh, so he he's probably the one I took the most influence from into. You know, I, I've got the you know this, the action, structural character stylings of David Gemmell, the esoteric horror, and b- huge breadth of invention of Clive Barker, coupled with the the epic, legendary thematics you get from Robert E. Howard, and it's you know stick them all in a blender and you you come up with, you know what I like to try and bring to the table. Yeah. Okay. Um, David Gamble, isn't that the the name of the award that you got for the Empire? 
that's in 2010. That, it's, that's the axe that's, right that's, behind that's me. That's the yeah. axe right behind you. All right, looming yeah, over Yeah, my you. novel. Yeah, my novel Empire won the David Gemmell Legend Award for best fantasy novel back in 2010, and that's that's it there. So did it because you took so much from his action scenes? How did it? Like obviously, you you talked about how it 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 felt kind of um, good to to receive an award for for fiction made by for Warhammer, but also. How did it feel to to have a reward named after one of your favorite authors oh, offered to you? I mean, I, I remember being in London when we were at the ceremony at, at the the Magic Circle uh, headquarters in London, and you know, being you know being on stage with all the other you know writers who were nominated, and then when they 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 read my name out as the the, the book that had won, and I you know I had gave a little you know quick speech. Uh, and David Gemmell's uh, family, some of them were in the front row of the, the auditorium. And yeah, the, like winning winning an award that had the name of the author who probably most inspired me to pick up a pen and start writing stories in the first place was a tremendously surreal experience. And it was one of the one of the high points of my career as a writer to have the name of the author who probably most inspired me in the world on the, an award that I was now holding on stage. That was, yeah, that was, that was an exquisite moment, yeah. Do you have a short story you would recommend by David Gemmell that we could um, cover on the podcast, maybe? I don't know that he's done, I mean, I'm trying to think, he hasn't really done many short stories and most of the, he's mostly a novelist. He hasn't, there's been collections where there are sort of novellas and so on, but if I was to, I mean, to, how to pick a, your favorite David Gemmell? God. Well, I'm that, I'm sorry. That's... You got to do it, and you got in ten. Um. <laughs> ooh, that's, that is a that's a really. T- I mean, the the novel that I read certainly the one that first got me hooked on him was a novel called Waylander, uh, which is just a tremendous piece of work. Um, the one he he did a a series based around the life of uh of the birth and then life of alexander the great but sort of with fantastical elements woven in to it uh called the first one was called lion of macedon and the second one was called dark prince and they were they're they're wonderful books i absolutely love them but then and he, and he did some standalone but a lot of standalone books so knights of dark renown is a book i loved of his uh, the John Shano books are great. The Swords of Night and Day. There's just there's too many. There's too many. I'm sorry. Sorry to cut <laughs> yeah. in. Sorry to cut in. Uh, because I am that guy. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, Graham, how you're feeling right now? Because we're coming up almost to two hours. We don't really want to uh, push you too much. And we really appreciate your time as well. So, well, it's just a, a couple more, then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up then. So I don't, okay. don't want to shortchange the conversation if we're still going but yeah i you know two hours is a long time for people to be yeah yeah, listening yeah. To me really on. really appreciate your time so nikki rob you guys all right go. well I, I gotta pick the good ones now aren't i all right so um in the novels that you've written for horace heresy um now I'm speaking as a this is a personal bias, right? I do like you as an author. I think you are my favorite Warhammer author, um, so to speak, and Thank probably you. probably my favorite sci-fi author. Um, you know, um, not, if I'm not thinking of, uh, um, you know, if I'm if I'm not forgetting any Russian author that I really love in sci-fi, but I think you you are my favorite one, um, and. I always got the feeling that you try to put yourself in the shoes of the characters that you're writing, right? It felt it felt so with Fulgrim, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Like his conversion that happens is is quite, you know, it's stagnant and it's and it's horrible, and you know you feel the dying of the light, right? You really feel that. So, mm-hmm. but there was I, unless I missed it, or maybe I haven't gone to it yet. I, I haven't seen any information about Fulgrim's possession by the demon. Was that, why did you guys, uh, did, was that a decision when you guys were pretending Primarchs, you know, in your Horus Heresy um, room? Or like, well, no, I mean, what with, was with going Fulgrim, on? I mean, I, I mean, thank you. Thank you for, for saying all that. But I mean, yeah, I think the, 
Well, I think one of the greatest qualities you can bring to bear as a writer is a sense of empathy. Uh, empathy for the characters and feeling what they're feeling and putting yourself in their position and, you know, not just the, what would I do in their situation, because that's kind of irrelevant. It's not what you would do, it's what they would do. And so, so you're filtering an empathy for their situation and figuring out what they would do and why. And I think if you can find that core to the character, your character will become more believable because you can think, yeah, that's what this person would absolutely do that. Or no, that person, no, they would never do that. Of course not. Um, in terms of the, the, I mean, the demon didn't possess Fulgrim for a huge amount of time because in the story, the reflection cracked the novella. Yeah. The the emperor's children, essentially, they try and have a like an intervention, so to speak. They try and they think Fulgrim has been possessed, so they torture him and do horrible, unspeakable things to him to try and drive the demon out. But by the time they get to the end of the process, Fulgrim actually tells them, actually, the demon's been gone for a long time. This was just kind of fun for me. Um, because Fulgrim is a, an incredibly powerful Primarch, and the the demon did not l lodge within his f flesh for too long. It was kind of like the one the thing that I liked that inspired me for that one. There's an episode of the TV show uh, Angel, it's a spin-off from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah, yeah. And there's an episode in Angel. I think it's season season two. I think because I think they're in the Hyperion. And there's a there's a little boy, and it's a sort of classic story of the family brings him the little boy, and the, the, he, they think he's possessed. Their son is possessed. There's a demon in him, sort of thing. And it's like you know, this boy's skin is coming up in wheels that say, "Help me!" You know, "Release me!" Mm. Ah. And all through the episode, they're trying to free the, the boy's soul. Blah blah blah. And it turns out actually, by the time you get to the end of the episode, you realise it's actually a, yes, a demon tried to possess him, but. This boy is an absolute psychopath monster, far worse than the demon. And all the the messages asking for help are actually from the demon, saying, "Please get me out of this psycho little kid." <laughs> ah. So I feel like if a demon was... possessed me, that would that would be happening. So yeah, so no. it's actually it's not the kid that's possessed; it's the demon that's trying to get out of this kid because it's um, the kid is a monster, far worse than the demon ever could be. So uh, I, I love that. I thought, oh, that's that's exactly what I imagine would happen to Fulgrim. That a demon gets in there and it realizes its its depravities and hideousness is far eclipsed by Fulgrim's at this point. He's fallen so far to the to Slanesh that the, the even the worst excesses of the demon pale in comparison to what Fulgrim is now capable of. So it wasn't too hard for Fulgrim eventually to kick it out, but you know, kick it out and absorb into himself some of its power and what it could do. Yeah. So that when these people came to try and get out, it was like, no man, it's already gone. I just kept the bits I liked and chucked out the rest. So it didn't really, I don't, I didn't really feel it needed an extra story of that because it felt like a, a a more fun revelation to tell that story where they think they're exercising him but actually it's already gone and he's just you know yeah. enjoying what they're doing to him amazing okay um so there the the favorite uh, novel uh for me uh in the Ural Ventures series i had to get a new one because my super old russian version is back home and i can't really go there at the moment as you may realize um yeah <laughs> uh, so this is volume one um and it has uh black black sun right dead sky the, black sun the, that's yeah dead sky black I, oh i feel so embarrassed that i didn't say the full title all right <laughs> and there there is a there is a planet on it the, the prison planet uh now in russia we say medregard but I'm sure it's mm -hmm. pronounced differently in... Uh, uh, in Medjingard, in... yeah. Yeah? Uh, no, no, you're, you're spot on Medjingard. the Iron Warrior's demon planet. Exactly. So, um, what <laughs> what did you do <laughs> to yourself in order to conceive of this world? How did you come up with the terrible things that are happening there? What, what headspace uh, were you, you know, in? So, so, I mean, it was the head... I mean, I can answer part of that with a very yeah. specific answer. Um, when I finished that book, um, 
you know, Nick, my editor, was like, well, what, what do you want to do next? And I was like, well, whatever it is, it's got to have sunshine and rainbows and <laughs> loveliness and greenery and yeah. soft winds over the meadows kind of thing, because I've been four months, whatever, trapped in this hell world of rusty scalpels and blood and dismemberment and surgical horrors and so on. Um well, no, again, that, that was my Dead Sky Black Sun was my because I love hor- I love horror, I love horror movies, I love writing yep. horror stories and so on. And to my mind, you know, this is long before we had the Warhammer horror range that we hadn't really explored the horror aspects. You know, there's lots of things in the Forty Universe that are horrible, but we hadn't really tr- done a horror novel set in the Warhammer Forty Thousand Universe. So. When I was looking to do something different with the third Uriel novel, because I didn't want to just do, you know, threat arises, they go fight it, the end. You I, know, I wanted to take them somewhere different. I wanted to do a different setting, a different yeah. scenario to put, you know, take them out of their element and just fuck with them for a bit. Um, so again, then this plays into my I, to make to bring back my love of Clive Barker's novels. Um, this is my version of like a, a sort of Iron Warriors 40k version of Hellraiser. So there's lots of hooks and barbs and nasty, spiky things that would hurt you uh, if you even so much as looked at them. So it was—it wasn't so much. I was—I was in a perfectly happy headspace. You know, I was. You know, most horror writers I've met have been just the loveliest, most gentle, lovely people in the world. But then you read their books and you think, "What the fuck is wrong with you?" <laughs> if they've but excised all people. of their terribleness. Yeah, into I mean, it's, the book. it's cathartic. You're getting all this yeah. evil out of you. Nah. Yeah. But. Um, that's yeah, it's just I wanted to. I wanted to write a horror. I wanted to write a forty k horror novel. That was yeah. the genesis of it, basically. And um, you know, and I, it was a it was a, com- a combined love of horror and Alistair MacLean because this is this is basically a forty k horror version of Where Eagles Dare, essentially. Um, so that was really. I just wanted to tell a horror story, and I could incorporate the kind of the things that I liked about Clive Barker's writing, and I could bring that and give it a forty k flavor. I've got one last question, uh, and then I think uh, actually I had a question as well. So this is this is I know all the way back at the beginning of this podcast we started talking about this little thing called the last church. I know some of you might have forgotten. Yeah, what we that have is, we have drifted it's, somewhat, but that's fine. Yeah, that's, that's a, well, that's why we're called the roll of yeah we're called roll of a tangent for a the reason. Tangent. <laughs> um, and all right, so first of all. I'm going to preface this with XJ, Robert. Uh, yes, I know I do this all the time. You can crucify me afterwards, but it's fine. I, I don't care. I think this is worth saying. I believe that uh, what may be needed for Warhammer 40,000 is to get The Last Church Part 2. Now, hear me out. Hear me out. Because this may sound like, what are you talking about? What is more of there to say? Well situation thousands of uh, ten thousands of years later has now changed a lot and mm-hmm. i think it would be so interesting to see what the emperor would say now to Uriel. what would mm-hmm. the and you could and you could if you didn't want to say definitively that the god emperor can speak in the in the um, yeah he's, you know, he's, like, he's a very different individual now yeah exactly right so if you don't want to say definitively that 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 is the guy on the gold of thrones speaking you could say that it is aspect lost in the warp that finds uriel and uriel went directly to chaos that's the way i see it he so his last defiance creates this aspect of him that went out there and you could even right i mean you know, if this is ever written, maybe we, we could delete this from the webs. Uh, so this could be like a revelation for you. But I'm giving this to you for free, Graham. Yeah. All right. You, revelation, be, no pun intended, with a character name. That's right. Exactly. So Uriel was somehow involved with beginning the heresy. And he's like, I knew you were a liar. And I did everything that my little soul could do. It was basically nothing in the uh, whole aspect of things, right? But you lied to me, and you knew you were lying. Why? <laughs> right? And I think that conversation, again, 10,000 years later, for the universe of Warhammer, you couldn't, you know, you can't make a definitive ending at the end, who's right and who's wrong, obviously. But I think it could add so much. What do you think? Of my there's, terrible there's idea? Certainly, there's certainly, <laughs> uh, you would have to, 
turn yourself in metaphysical hoops to tell it, but that's perfectly possible. The warp in the warp, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. um, sure, why not? It could absolutely be done. You could actually, you know, whether it be the emperor or somebody encountering some aspect in the warp. You know, I met your emperor back when he was just a wee golden lad on Terra, and we had a chat in our church sort of thing. You know, absolutely, you could tell that story. You know, like I was, you know, I was there the day the emperor left Terra. Blah blah blah. Boom. Sure, you yeah. could do that. Uriel Ventress meets Uriel. Next uh, book, you heard it here first. No. <laughs> <laughs> um okay. all right so um actually you had a you had a final question yeah. didn't you let's yes. go for a good, good final one yeah um, I, up, I remember i wanted to leave uh any of our listeners who might be thinking about writing with something so i wanted to ask you what would you what is your advice for people wanting to start out with a writing career in this time and age because it's quite different from way back when yeah it's, it's yeah i mean the, the advice i would have given five years 10 years 15 years ago would each of them would be very different um in the landscape of publishing has changed immeasurably uh you know self-publishing is open to all of us now you know whatever story you want to tell the the, the editing tools the cover tools you know ai generated art that you could the, the you know the the sky's the limit really but you know what the, the, the craft of storytelling has not changed particularly you know tastes may have changed in the readership the, what sales has changed but in terms of crafting a good story that that hasn't changed in a long time um so yeah i you know it depends if you're if you're writing tie-in fiction or your own original fiction but again have have something have something to say even beyond it's space lasers and reptiles from the center of the earth or you know a drama in a lake house between a man and a woman trapped there for two weeks at the end of the world whatever doesn't matter what the books are what's happened to the book but have something to say in your storytelling whether it's a particular bugbear or peccadillo you have that you like to explore in stories know your characters be be driven by them you know like it's it's great to have a high concept you know what if this or what if that but if the characters and the relationships within that are not interesting nobody's going to care if what's at stake doesn't matter nobody's going to care i mean the stakes can be they don't have to be saving the universe you know the stakes can be vitally important to these two people in the course of this in, in the in the course of the the world oh hang on my, my headphones have just died so hang on, let me just hang on i'm gonna have to sort, oh, sort my audio you. can you hear me yeah yeah we can yeah, hear you we can hear you okay, fine that's okay it's just no. the headphones just died on me there so yeah i mean happens as long as the stakes matter to the people involved in the story then it's yeah. still ma it's still worth telling so understand your characters you know what you know expressing the characters want is very important because i need to understand what this character wants in the story uh, even above you know the external one of i've got to get the nuclear warheads back before the terrorists use them to block this but what do they have what inside i want to reconnect with my son i want to you know be at peace with my father's death or whatever it is you know so Finding out who your characters are is probably the most important thing to do when you start figuring out what they want, what they're good at, and what rocks they're carrying in their backpack that are weighing them down. Figuring out the poles of the character, where they start and where they end, because the character who the character who starts the book can't be the one that ends it. Because you know, change is what we keeps us going through a story. You know, like the things they learn or don't learn, as the case may be along the way, is what will allow them to finally get a, a victory whether that is something as you know obvious as defeating a bad guy or yeah. coming to terms with a thing within themselves whatever that victory is needs to be earned you know i need to feel that these characters have been through a, a, an emotional or physical or both ringer to have gotten to the point where they're at the end and can convincingly end the story in a way that's satisfying 
and has given me a journey along with them where you know hopefully when you put the book down you're left with a a sense of satisfaction that you maybe want to think about it some more or you, you know a great book is one that you put down and think I, I need to speak to somebody about this i have to talk to my pals and tell them about this book and so on uh so i mean they're that sort of crafty things but like develop develop good writing habits you know i, I wouldn't i would never say you must write every day or you're not a proper writer it's like but you know developing a regular habit of putting words in the page is good uh you know ring fencing your time because obviously you know not all of us not all not everybody can say well i'm going to be a full-time writer this is what i'm going to do you know some you might get 10 minutes here you might be looking after a relative a kid or whatever so you, you but when you if you can you can say like between two and three unless the house is burning down or your head's falling off leave me alone to write right you know and being protective and not being not feeling precious about protecting that time to write is good set like we talked about earlier set yourself deadlines that are meaningful and not and you know break these deadlines into smaller amounts you can't say well by july i'm going to write a novel i mean that's you know it's you know it's like the old thing you know how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time you know i first time i sat down to write a novel i was like how the hell do you do this i mean novels are huge things how, how do you even do that and i had to sort of go to that place of going okay well it's just it's 20 chapters okay each chapter is four or five scenes okay let's tackle that scene let's tackle this scene you know and there's again you've got the argument of the the pantser and the plotter do you just do you structurally plan everything out do you just see where the writing takes you and you know i like to do a bit of both i like to have a, a scaffolding around knowing what i'm doing but have a flexibility built in so that when you know once you've actually got the writing going and you realize no actually it needs to go this way not that way you can adapt to it and that's where the role playing things can comparison helps out that you've you've built that muscle to be adaptable in your storytelling um and yeah set yourself smaller deadlines be accountable to yourself ask people to be accountable to hold you accountable for it find good readers that will give you honest constructive actionable feedback you know don't just you know give it to your mom and she's oh it's the best thing i've ever read <laughs> you know give it to people who you, you need that you need yeah. a mix of people who inspired to keep going by saying it's good and you need to, people to challenge you by saying it could be better and you need both of those people in your corner amazing point yeah mm -hmm. so um, i mean it's a long-winded way of saying just get your arse in the chair put words on the page and be collaborative and be open to other people's feedback amazing well, well thank you very much graham yeah i i i was reminded i'm i am reminded of what my art teacher told me the last thing you should, sh the last person you should show your art to is your mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, was... now and again, it's good to have your mom in your corner saying that this is wonderful. Yeah, because that's true. But then she won't true. tell you what's we wrong with it. People to tell us, you know, we need validation. Like it or not, we, we thrive on that. And whether that's a, a reader saying, I, I loved your book, I love this story, that character spoke to me, or, and I, you also need to be able to say, I, didn't get that you know i didn't get what you were saying there or that wasn't clear or this was a bit clunky okay so it's, it's you need a mix we need to be challenged and we need to be affirmed and those things in the right blend are really you know what help you push forward right it's the balance. You it's rubbish, the balance then of... you're like why am i gonna put why am i gonna bother doing this but if everyone's telling you work great and it's not that's not a lot of help either yeah, so it's the balance between the positive yeah, and negative. In balance in all things. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like so, I've heard uh, that line somewhere. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah, um, let's let's go around the table and give uh, the last church our our final score. So for me, it is a surprising. I know nine point five out of ten. Uh, the the five points that I've taken off. Um, uh, you know, but because I felt that maybe we could have given Ryle one or two points where he could maybe not make the Emperor question himself, but at least make them strong enough where the Emperor kind of can't agree with them and can't dismiss them. So he 
mm -hmm. to, uh, to, goes to the, a different topic or something, right? So uh, if that was there, it would have been a ten out of ten. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. nine point five. Um, I will I will some, say something right at the end of this thing because I don't want to take too much more time. But XJ, why don't you give us the uh, the score of yours? And if you abstain, I swear to God, I'm going to count. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not going to cop out. I will give it a 7 uh, out of 10. And the reason is it's not higher is only because I'm not a Warhammer fan. Mm. Uh, in, in the sense that Nikki is. I, I like the law of Warhammer, but I'm not so deep into it like he is. Now, because yeah. if I am a fan like that, I would be hanging on to the Empress every word because that is the only time he spoke. Mm. Yeah. And time. and I really enjoyed I really enjoyed the fact that Uriel did not uh, go with the emperor. I really like that. It, it's it it made the uh, question more fuller. Mm. If, I'm not sure if I'm making any sense, but it's it no, no, I, I, felt I, I, more. Yeah. There's more, you know, just because he did not go with the emperor. And uh, mm. yeah, and. Uh, and uh, the arguments themselves were were very, very fairly. They were even handed. You know what mm. I mean? It's like you, yeah. you have the atheist side, but you also properly uh, presented the faith side. So I, I really like that. Yeah. All right. Robert, what is what is your score? Oh, we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. That is that is truly awful. We can't. We can't hear Robert. Um, maybe your you unplugged your microphone or something. While this is happening, uh, Graham, what do you give the last church? What is uh, what is your score for? Um, it's just it's a story. I have, I have a lot of fondness for it. Um, I think at the time, I think it was I. I was writing from a place of very. <laughs> <laughs> very maybe over earnestness and and strident of what I was trying to say at the time, and I think your argument, your your talk there about giving Uriah more of an argument that he could win, essentially that you know would be like, yeah, you know what, good point. I I have nothing to refute that. You know, making no, I don't think he was a straw man, but making him have a stronger argument might have been once something I would have done if I was to do if I was to have my time again, that might be what I would do. Well, the one time that you did republish a book, Ninebringer, I remember you refusing basically do edits to it, right? Because you oh, were like using it wasn't like they demanded and I refused. They, <laughs> they asked if they wanted to do any edits to it. And I originally was thought, oh yeah, because I think as as a, I think you probably read then that I I think I could probably have made it a technically better book, but I think the heart of it would have stayed. I don't think I would have improved or I don't think I would have changed any of that because it was a book of the time who I was when I wrote it. So I think changing it would have changed what the book meant to me. So I was like, no, it, it is what it is, and I don't I don't want to mess with it. Fair enough. Okay, so so that we can let you go and you can have your day. Here's my one last final thing that I wanted to say. Now, um, this has nothing to do with Warhammer. This has, uh, um, you know, n nothing to do with any any sort of understanding of what is a story, how how what is ri this writing, what is it all about. But it is to do with some of the points that you made right there at the end. You see, um. I mean, this this is um, this is coming back to my childhood. My my father and I, uh, we had a communication problem. We never would be able to understand one another. You know, we we had clashes. You know, um, I think at a certain point, I would say I, I, I hated my father in some aspects. You know, things that I probably regret saying to him. But there was this one trip, uh, this one vacation uh, to to Egypt. And we we went there, and I went to a bookstore, and I saw this big blue, shiny book, on the on the on the on the counter. It wasn't because uh, it was the new arrival, and it was the omnibus of the Ultramarines, mm -hmm. and the cover excited me. I saw these guys, and I thought, this is awesome. I'm gonna grab it. 
And so I'm, I went to Egypt. I'm, I'm reading it on my way there in, in the, in the thing. And my father and I, we haven't spoken for maybe like five days or something at a time. And he looks at the cover and he says, who are these guys? What is that? That, that kind of looks like those uh, models you make right but yours are purple and i'm like yeah yeah it's space marines dad right and he's like space marines like the ones from starship troopers I'm like no dad they're like biologically enhanced killer machines and they can destroy anything uh you know whatever you know, starship trooper guys are bullshit right i answered in in because i was angry right at him and he was like well well how far are you and i'm like well i've just finished the first book of the omnibus you know, so I'm I'm starting the second one soon. And he said, could I read it? And I said, okay, um, sure. And I gave it to him and he went on the beach and he read it a bunch. And then every evening when we had our dinners, it was like this hotel where you, where you can, all, all you can eat kind of thing. We would discuss Uriel Ventress and his heavy, uh, heavy weapons guy. I'm, I'm forgetting his name at this very moment. It's been oh, a while yeah. since that. That, that's right he was my favorite character isn't it hilarious that i forgot his name um and we would discuss what they were going to do next and what was going on with his hand and you know and you know you said the best book is the book um that you get to talk to someone about it and for me this was the the bridge between mm. me and my father well that's awesome man and and for that for sharing that Exactly, and I and I wanna I wanna thank you for that. The you know this um, this changed it uh, our relationship. So wow. thank you very much. That's, I, again, thank. That's an amazing story. Thank you. I mean that to to know you've made a connection with somebody through the written word is you know what every author wants. They they want I want you to feel something good or bad when you read my work. That it, you know, and to allow to have allowed a connection between you and your father in a shared enjoyment of a story and a character is that's just brilliant. I, I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, wow. Uh, yeah. Sir, that I dropped that heavy thing on you at no, the end, but no, I no. thought if I said yeah, it at the beginning, you, 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 love, be like, you, oh, you love to hear those sort of things. That's, you know, you, connection with the reader is what you're striving for. So to hear that is, really profound to me thank you all right and to completely spoil this beautiful moment if you ever want to play D, &D just message me on twitter i've, I've got a bunch of things no i'm kidding uh, graham thank you so much for joining us uh dear viewers thank you so much for for being here with us these two uh, two and a half hours almost and uh no. yeah i i hope everyone enjoyed pleasure. their journey oh, it was a pleasure yeah thank you so much graham thank you thank you for having me on